Hey, legendary legion. Kronos back at it with. What if Decca had all for one part four? Smash that like button, hit subscribe, because today we're taking the insanity to a whole new level. You won't believe the quirks and twists we've got in store. Chapter 17 Tenya hated crying. He didn't mind it in other people. One could hardly help the intensity of their emotions, after all, and crying was literally one's body getting rid of excess hormones so that it could return to an equilibrium. In himself, though, he hated it. His chest got tight, his nose ran everywhere, and even his glasses got smeared and dirty from his wet eyelashes rubbing against the lenses. His face got blotchy as well, staying discolored for what felt like hours and making sure that everyone that saw him knew exactly what he'd been doing. Tenya hated crying, and he hated crying in front of his brother even more. Scrubbing at his face, his glasses dangling from his free hand, Tenya struggled to get his breathing under control. He was sitting in the changing room that 1A had been assigned, hunched over one of the tables. He'd come here right after leaving the stadium's pitch, his phone beginning to buzz in his pocket to prevent his brother from seeing him break down. He'd wanted so badly to get to the third round. It had been a surprise this morning, seeing his brother waiting for him at the breakfast table, and even more of one to hear that he would be assisting present Mike with the commentary for the festival. He'd known that his brother would likely be watching today, but knowing that he would actually be physically present had put a fire in him to do his best. He'd taken on the obstacle course with zeal, and then had been looking around for a team in the cavalry battle when that boy with the purple hair had come up to him and said something. And then the battle had been over. He'd been standing there, with no idea what had happened. He looked up at the board and seen his name there, with the purple-haired boy's name, Shiso Hitoshi, and he hadn't had the faintest clue as to how that happened. We did pretty well, didn't we? Shinso had said blandly as midnight had talked, dismissing all of them for lunch. He turned waving Tenya away like he was some sort of annoying insect. See you in the next round. A mind control quirk. Tensei had told him about them several times, as they tended to make tough opponents. A mind control quirk, and this Shinso had used it on him. He hadn't had to, if he just asked. Tenya squeezed his hands into fists so tight that it hurt, a fresh wave of tears brewing in the corners of his eyes. He'd seen how hard the others had fought for their places in the tournament during lunch. Videos had already been uploaded online, showing off the various teams. Su Chan Kun's team with Midoriya, Todoroki, and Niraraka in particular, they had taken Bakuga's attacks with aplomb, with Su Chan Kun showing her cool headedness off in the final seconds. Meanwhile, he had just been running around in the background with a vacant look on his face. Standing there on the pitch as the tournament was explained, he hadn't been able to stand it. Knowing how hard everyone else had worked while he was ridden like a dumb animal, he didn't deserve to stand alongside the others. So he had excused himself, the back of his neck burning with his brother's imaginary gaze, and then run away to cry to himself like a little boy. He was useless. He'd shamed his family with his conduct today. Tenya! The door behind him banged open, making him jump. Turning in his seat, Tenya felt about an inch tall as he took in the panting, red-cheeked figure of his brother standing in the doorway a mixture of relief and worry painted across his face. Letting the door fall shut behind him, Tensei entered the room and crossed it to get to the table where Tenya was sitting in two long strides, sitting down on it with a thump and taking Tenya's face in his hands. Tenya, what happened out there? A lump swelled in Tenya's throat. Nisan I, was all he managed to croak out before a sob escaped him. Ducking his head, he swallowed furiously and tried to ignore the feeling of more hot tears streaking down his face. He was fifteen, not five. He shouldn't be crying. Hey, 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 Tensei said, stopping him from lowering his head any further. Tenya, I'm not mad, okay? I'm just worried. You were so excited for the festival, and then you dropped out. I just wanted to make sure you were okay. Tenya sniffed, his nose making a revolting noise. I'm fine, he said wetly. You didn't need to leave your job. I didn't mean to cause trouble between you and present Mike Sensei. Hey now, enough of that, Tensei said sternly. He forced Tenya to look up into his eyes, his brows furrowed together in concern. You didn't cause any trouble at all. Hizashi knows how much you mean to me. If I hadn't left when I did he would have pushed me out the door himself. Tenya sniffed again, his eyes welling up once more. Still, I'm sorry for making you come down here. I just... 
his throat swelled up. Tensei's expression, already sympathetic, only softened further. A thumb swiped under Tenya's eyes, brushing away the tears that had begun to fall. Then those hands were pulling him close, into his brother's arms and a hug that reminded him of home. The tears that had been wiped away were replaced quickly, flowing onto his brother's stiff armor. Deep breaths, little brother. It took several long minutes before the tears stopped. Before Tenya could speak again without his voice being choked out in his throat. Finally, though, the bands around his chest loosened and he could speak properly. Picking up the glasses that he'd put down on the table as the tears started, Tenya wiped his eyes one last time before putting them back on and looking at his brother. I'm sorry, he began again. Tensei batted away his apology with a patient hand. There's nothing to apologize for, he said calmly. I came down here because I was worried that you were hurt. Tenya sniffed wetly, adjusting his glasses. Not physically, he said, twisting his fingers. Just, he trailed off. Thankfully, his brother took over the conversation, as he always did on the rare occasions when words failed him. You were really excited about the sports festival, he said, his voice calm and not judging Tenya in the slightest. I was surprised when you quit. You said that you hadn't earned your place there. Tenya pressed his lips together and gripped his knees. I didn't. I wasn't even aware during the cavalry battle. His brother didn't say anything, radiating an encouraging silence. The rider. Tenya choked on the boy's name. Shiz so, he has, has a mind control quirk. All I remember is him coming up to me and saying something, and then waking up at the end of the round. He clenched his teeth. I watched the highlights during my lunch, compared to everyone else. Tenya, his brother said softly. He shifted in his seat, placing a gentle hand on his shoulder. Tenya shook his head. You have to have seen how hard everyone else fought for their place. Midoriya and his team, if Su Chan Kun hadn't kept such a cool head, they would have been left out. He gripped the fabric covering his legs tighter. And there I was, scooting around in the background. I didn't deserve to stand on the same platform as the rest of them. Tenya could feel his brother's thumb rubbing soothing circles on his shoulder. I wanted to be there, to make our family proud, but if I allowed myself to continue on I would have been shaming the hard work of my classmates and embarrassing our family. His voice broke and he ducked his head, unable to look at his brother. His glasses were fogging up again. The thumb rubbing circles slowed. Stopped. And then Tenya was being pulled from his seat into a gentle hug. Tenya, his brother said with a soft pride, there's nothing you could do that would bring shame to our family. The tears that he had been trying so hard to keep back broke through the dam and began to stream down Ida's face. Letting go of his pants, he wrapped his arms around his brother's chest and dug his fingers into the cracks between the pieces of armor. Nisan, you took a moral stand and stuck to it. His brother continued, hugging him back. There was nothing shameful in your conduct today, Tenya. Tenya sniffled. That shiz so. He used me, used his quirk on me. It was some sort of mind control. All he had to do was ask. Tensei squeezed him closer. Raising a hand, he began to pet the top of Tenya's head. Well, people with mind control quirks tend to be regarded with suspicion. He might not have thought that you would be willing to work with him. Tenya pulled back slightly, raising his glasses to wipe at his eyes. He could feel his lower lip jutting out in a pout, but couldn't stop it. He didn't even try, though, he said mulishly. Tensei laughed softly and ruffled his hair. Cut him a little slack, Tenya, he said gently. He's probably spent his whole life being shunned for his quirk. Tenya frowned and readjusted his glasses so that they were sitting straight on his face. His whole life? His older brother's face lost the gentle amusement that had been painted across it. Yeah he said. His mouth twisted. People judge others very strongly on their quirks, Tenya. I know that Semi was always very on the ball about bullying, but a lot of other schools aren't, and outside of such places. He trailed off and shrugged, looking uncomfortable. People can be cruel. If you're called a villain every time you reveal your quirk, even if you don't use it, well, I think it's understandable that in a contest like the festival, he wasn't about to risk being unable to form a team. Tenya looked down at his hands again, which had fallen back into his lap. His brow furrowed. He hadn't even thought of it like that. It's all right to be upset that he used his quirk on you like that, Tensei continued. 
But you should also keep these sorts of things in mind. A lot of villains that I've found myself facing have similar sorts of stories. They have a quirk that society deems villainous, and feel like there's nothing else they can do, you know? Sometimes, all they really need is someone to give them a chance, not more chiding. Raising his hand, he ruffled Tenya's hair again. Tenya didn't stop frowning, though. That didn't occur to me, he said slowly. He squeezed his hands into fists. I was simply so angry. Well, you are still in school, Tensei replied. You're supposed to learn here. Tenya simply nodded. To have a villainous quirk, and that Shinso had been at their door the day the sports festival was announced, stating his aim to enter the hero course. What sort of strength did it take to be told over and over that your quirk was suited to villainy and still want to be a hero? The hand in his hair left his scalp to clap down on his shoulder. Jerked out of his thoughts, Tenya watched his brother stand up. Well, his brother said, if you're feeling better you should probably go up to sit with your classmates. I met a few of them on my way down and they were very worried about you. Ah, Tenya stood up quickly enough to make his chair screech across the floor. Oh dear, I'll have to apologize to them for that. I didn't mean to worry them. Tensei just laughed. It's fine, it's fine. He reassured as they both headed towards the door. I told them that you probably just needed a little time to yourself. I should still apologize, Tenya insisted. Pausing in the doorway, he turned and bowed to his brother. Thank you, though, for telling them that. I don't think that I would have properly appreciated their concern earlier. It's no problem. Tensei said, opening the door to let them both out. And Tenya? Tenya was already halfway out of the room. Pausing, he turned to look at his brother. Yes? Tensei's face was soft, his mouth curling into a smile. I'm really proud of you. Izuku was not entirely sure how he had gotten himself into this situation. Holding a watering can and tipping it at a gentle angle, he struggled to decide between watching the match that Recovery Girl had playing on a television nearby and watching Shiyazaki's vines grow as he sprinkled water down on them. On one hand it was Tsuchan, the girl who had managed to get their group through to the final round, who was fighting now. On the other hand, seeing how quickly the thorny vines that made up Shiyazaki's hair were growing was fascinating in itself. They didn't seem to be any particular type of vine that he had ever seen before, but it wasn't like he was someone that was very interested in gardening. Considering the rate of growth, it couldn't just be the water triggering such a change. Perhaps it was sucking out nutrients through the scalp? If so, though, why would they need watering as well? If the vines could get nutrients through Shizaki's skin, then surely they could also get water. I'm not sure, Shizaki said peaceably, her head tilted back to help the water roll along her scalp. Most of the time, I can force my vines to grow without needing a watering but if I try and do it for too long or too often they'll eventually stop until I directly water them. Izuku jumped a little, splashing a little water on Shiyazaki's forehead and making her nose wrinkle. Sorry, he said in embarrassment. Sometimes I don't realize that I'm talking out loud when I'm thinking. You said that they'll stop growing on their own, though? Shiyazaki wiped at the water he'd spilled on her forehead and nodded, sending droplets into the bucket that had been set up behind the chair she was sitting in. Izuka had stopped watering her as she had begun to speak and was now letting the watering can dangle from his fingers. Reaching up, he tugged at his lower lip as he turned that piece of information over in his mind. Maybe it's an inbuilt safety valve? Meant to prevent the vines from taking too much water or nutrients from the rest of your body? It sounds similar to parts of Recovery Girl's quirk, almost, where some injuries can't be healed all at once without draining the body of vital energy. The fact that your vines can get that energy from being treated like normal plants. The door to the nurse's office slammed open, bouncing off of the wall. Jumping a little, Izuka turned his head to see who had come in and saw several members of One B spilling into the small room. At the head of them was a girl with orange hair and side ponytail. Shiyazaki, the girl said, crossing over to the chair where the other girl was sitting. Sorry, we wanted to come and see you but Manoma was being a pain. She stopped as she noticed Izuku and flushed slightly, raising her hands. Ah, uh, geez, sorry again. Midoriya, right? Ah, uh, yeah, Izuku said, shifting his weight from one foot to the other. He wasn't quite sure how this was going to go. Shiyazaki had been nice enough, but Minoma had more than enough personality. Before anything else, I want to apologize for the cavalry battle, the girl said, putting his fears to rest. 
I heard from his teammates some of the stuff Manoma said to you guys, and I just want you to know that not all of 1B is like that. Nervously clutching the watering can, Izuka shrugged, not quite able to meet the other girl's eyes. Oh, uh, no need to worry, I know that he's an outlier. He lied. Shiozaki and me were just talking about her quirk, actually. He was helping me regrow my vines a little before we went back to our seats. Shiozaki interrupted smoothly. I had a bit of a neck strain, but Recovery Girl fixed that right up, Kendo-san. The newly named Kendo's attention switched back to her classmate, and she smiled. That's good to hear. Yeah, chimed in a boy with white hair and shadow black skin that had entered along with Kendo. He grinned, the white of his teeth the only detail that Izuka could pick out of his face aside from his eyes. That fight was impressive though, dude. Shiozaki's no pushover. Ah, uh, thanks, Izuka replied, still unsure. His class hadn't really mingled outside of itself after the USJ, too aware of the hostility that the rest of the school seemed to feel towards them. The other boy didn't seem offended by his unenthusiastic response, thankfully. He stuck out his hand, his grin widening. Kawaro Shirai. And the others with me are Kodai Yui, Rin Hiryu, and Tokage Setsuna. The others are busy watching the matches or preparing. Switching to carrying the watering can in one hand, Izuka took the other boy's hand and shook it. Um, nice to meet you, I guess. He froze as the words left his lips and immediately began to backpedal. I mean, it's nice to meet you outside of the competition. Not that I'm unsure whether it's nice to meet you at all. Kendo snorted, hiding her mouth with her hand. Izuka flushed and stopped talking, closing his mouth with a click. Looking around the room, he tried to find something to change the subject to. Thankfully, his eyes soon fell upon the perfect excuse. Oh, hey, he said, his voice shrill. The fight's finally starting. The TV that was set into the wall was showing the platform that was set up for the fights, fully repaired and with Suchan and Aoyama standing at opposite ends. On a platform, Midnight stood with her hand on her hip, looking the two of them over. There was no sound, but Izuka could imagine present mix overly excited introductions being screened through the stadium. The cameras were switching between showing Tsuchan and Aoyama's faces, Tsuchan calm and collected, her eyes focused on her opponent, and Aoyama winking at the camera as it passed him by. Oh yeah, the next match, Tokage said, shaking her dark hair out of her eyes. Separating from the group, she came over to stand next to Izuku, crossing her arms over her chest and grinning at him. They're both your classmates. Have you decided who you're going to cheer on? Izuku hesitated, knowing that he shouldn't answer right away. Su Chan, he admitted. The other boy seemed nice, but Su Chan had been the one to help him get through to this round. It would just be rude not to cheer for her. Tokage's face split into a sharp toothed grin. Su Chan, she said, sounding delighted. My goodness, you want a kid sure do move fast, don't you? It's only been a month. Izuka was confused for a moment. Then he realized what the other girl was saying and his cheeks caught fire. No, 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 he said, dropping the watering can to let it spill on the floor. No, it's not like that. She asked everyone to call her that. W-E, we're not. The others broke into giggles as he sputtered. Tokage's grin just grew wider and wider as he stumbled over his words, trailing off into a muttering fit. Behind him, there was a sharp bark of laughter. A hand slapped him on the back hard enough to make him take a step forward. Turning his head, Izuka saw that it was Rin, who had crossed the room while Izuka was looking at the TV. Don't worry, she knows, he said, slinging his arm over Izuka's shoulders. She's just teasing you. Izuka wrung his hands. I know that, he said nervously. I just don't want people getting the wrong idea about our class. Everyone's already angry with us for being attacked. Not everyone, Koda said quietly. Turning his head again, he saw that the quiet girl and Kendo were helping Shiozaki up from her seat so that she could sit on one of the beds. Izuka bit the inside of his cheek and wrung his hands a little harder. Maybe not everyone, but still a lot of people. Well, they're all dicks. Kowaro called from where he was leaning against the wall, shrugging like his words were self-evident. The blunt, unapologetic statement startled a nervous giggle out of Izuku. On the screen, Midnight slashed her cat nine tails through the air signaling the start of the match and drawing his attention in. Looking at the matchup just by quirks, it was an interesting. It could be argued that both specialized in long-range attacks, 
but with Su Chan's powerful legs and jumps, she could easily get in close fast and... Aoyama skipped across the ground like a stone across water and off the edge of the ring. And kick him out of the ring. On the screen, the crowd was going wild as Su Chan stood in the middle of the ring. Izuku hadn't known her for long, but he was pretty sure that there was a look of satisfaction on her froggy face. Tokage let out a long, low whistle as Kawaro and Rin both burst into laughter. Damn, she said, sounding impressed. That was fast. He didn't even have a chance to let off his quirk. Izuka couldn't stop the proud grin from spreading across his face. Yeah, he said excitedly. With her frog quirk, she's an excellent all-rounder with both long- and short-range combat capabilities. She also has a cool head. I mean, you probably had a chance to see her during the cavalry battle. She was able to keep her head at the very end and figure out that we only really needed the ten million headband, which will really come in handy when she goes into rescue work because panic is one of the top killers in situations where rescue heroes are needed. Okay man, we got it, Rin said, taking his arm off of Izuka's shoulders and holding his hands up in mock surrender. Jeez, I defended you earlier and all, but I'm starting to think that maybe Tokage was onto something with you. Izuka snapped his mouth shut and blushed, covering the lower half of his face with his hands for good measure. It's not that, he insisted in a squeak. I just really like watching people use their quirks well. Kawaro was still chuckling as he pushed off of the wall and came over, plopping himself on one of the free beds. If you say so. Izuka felt his cheeks heat up even more. Don't be embarrassed, I thought that what you were saying was very interesting, Kendo said. She was sitting on the side of Shizaki's bed now, also watching the screen where the next fight was being set up. It was between Jairu and a boy from 1B. Kendo patted the spot beside her, inviting him to sit. Do you have any thoughts on this matchup? Looking at the others, none of them looked aggressive despite their earlier laughter, so he gingerly took a seat beside the redhead, his cheeks still hot. Um, I don't actually know as much about Jairusan, but I know that she has a sound-based quirk. Your classmate, though, I don't know at all. A ways, Shiyazaki said from behind him where she was lying down. He can create molecular bonds between two objects. Ah, uh, Shiyazaki, you do know that they could be facing each other, right? Shiyazaki raised her head a little to shoot an unimpressed look at Kowaro. He's taking place in a televised tournament. It's not like he wouldn't find out anyways. Tokage laughed again. She's got you there. Izuka had intended to go back to sit with the rest of his class after he had finished helping Shiyazaki with her vines. For the rest of the round, though, Izuka didn't quite manage to get up from the bed he was sitting on. Being there, trading comments with the other kids in the hero course was surprisingly comfortable, considering Manoma's behavior towards him and his team. Perhaps Kendo had been correct, and most of 1B didn't hold any hard feelings towards 1A. It was easy to believe as they watched Jaira trip a ways out of bounds with her ear jacks after being bonded with the floor of the ring, and cheered all the same for the unexpected victory. As the matches went by, Izuka relaxed more and more. The 1B students cheered and laughed and asked him questions as he went on muttering jags about the quirks he saw. Yuraraka and Yairoza fought, with Yuraraka managing a surprise win by pounding on Yairoza fiercely enough to keep her from thinking and forcing her out of the ring. To his shame, Izuku was surprised, but he was still proud watching one of his friends jumping up and down in joy at her victory. Kaken's victory over his opponent, 1BS Hananuki Juzu, was less unexpected to him but had his fellow audience members gasping in surprise. Then there was another short match, between the purple-haired boy, Shinso, Izuka thought his name was, and a pink-haired girl from the support course where the girl had immediately stepped outside of the ring and forfeited her chance, and Kirishima versus a boy named Tetsutetsu who seemed to be a metallic copy of the boy. Finally thought they were at the last match of the first round. Todoroki versus Siro. Izuka was particularly interested in watching this match. The conversation that they had had during lunch had not stopped bubbling in the back of his mind, merely simmering down during the other matches. Cyril was stretching his arms above his head casually as Midnight repeated the rules, showing off the growths on his elbows that created the tape that was his quirk. Todoroki's face was still in a way that made Izuka's stomach do a slow, uncomfortable flip. He recognized that blankness. He'd seen it plenty of times in the mirror. It was the blankness of someone repressing a wave of irrepressible emotion. His hands, which had been gesturing wildly as he chatted through all of the other matches, 
fell into his lap where they gripped the fabric of his pants. The others were talking enthusiastically with each other, betting on whether or not the son of the number two hero would make a good showing in his defeat of Ciro. Izuka couldn't bring himself to chide them. The tension gripping him was too strong. Midnight raised her cat nine tails. Ciro was still stretching his arms, but Izuka could tell that he was paying very close attention to Todoroki. Todoroki was unreadable. Midnight brought the cat nine tails down, and the match started. Ciro switched from stretching to shooting out tape instantly, saying something that the cameras couldn't pick up and entangling Todoroki right away. He pulled, sending Todoroki skidding along the ground towards the edge of the ring. And then there was ice. A mass of ice appeared in the blink of an eye, large enough to poke up past the top of the stadium, and catching Ciro in it without trouble. Rhymed with frost and clearly shivering, Midnight asked Ciro if he could continue, despite the answer being obvious to everyone. Ciro replied incredulously, this speech being caught by the cameras, but Izuku was unable to pay attention to it. He couldn't tear his eyes away from the small figure of Todoroki, standing in front of the iceberg with rounded shoulders. Stepping forward, he began to thaw Ciro. The others had been shocked by the abrupt violence of Todoroki's attack, and only now were starting to talk again in hushed whispers. His back looked so sad, Izuku found himself thinking. So sad and alone, like how Izuku had felt before coming Yui. Sorohiko, known as Gran Torino to most of the world that bothered to notice him, took a determined slurp of his coffee. The microwave that he was warming his taiyaki and continued to hum along to itself, unmoved. He had ached as he got up this morning, news of the Yui Sports Festival filling the room from his radio alarm clock. Not an ache in his bones, those were ever present at his age, and honestly he barely even noticed them at this point in his life. No, it was an ache in his chest today, an emptiness that couldn't be filled. He had never been fond of the festival, even while teaching at the damned school, but this year in particular it fell on a bad day. The day his best friend had been murdered, leaving him alone with a boy she had loved like a son and a duty that was too heavy for one set of shoulders to carry. His coffee had gotten more than a small nip of alcohol poured into it that morning. At times like this, when Nana's shadow was a heavy weight in the back of his head, he didn't often go out on patrol. Mostly he just stayed home and watched TV, forcing himself to pay attention to whatever was on until he could go to sleep again. Today, though, with the sports festival dominating all of the channels, he knew that he would have to go out just to keep from going insane from the memories that the school forced to the surface. On every channel he could see the students in their familiar uniforms, their faces set in a familiar determination that brought back the familiar memories of the short years between Nana passing one for all on and her murder at the hands of that monster. As he waited for his breakfast-slash-lunch to finish warming up, his phone buzzed on the table. Pulling it from his belt, he couldn't keep his lip from curling slightly at the sight of who was texting him. Sir Naitai was not a bad man. Sorohiko would never say that. Rather he would say that he was a busybody and a nuisance that had never met a topic that he'd hesitated to give his opinion on. Case in point, one for all. Now, Sorohiko had not been particularly impressed the first time he had met Tashinori. He had thought that the kid was a delusional brat at best with his chatter about symbols, and had wondered if Nana hadn't glommed onto him because she missed her own son so badly. she disappeared for nearly a year after her husband had died, to some place that even he couldn't find her. She was a woman that felt things deeply, so learning that that was the case with Tashinori wouldn't have surprised him. But slowly, the kid had proven himself. When Nana had taken the chance and pulled him out of foster care to personally take him in, he had thanked her by studying so hard that he got into Yui with some of the highest scores in its history. When she had finally deemed him capable of taking on one for all, he had used it to win the first year's sports festival and get transferred into the hero course and when she had held the line against all for one, he had honored her sacrifice by becoming the symbol she had seen in him. Every step of the way, Tashinori had proven that he deserved to be the eighth holder. And then Night Eye had come in and shoved his pet project in Tashinori's face, like Nana's quirk was something to be so coldly passed on. He took another swallow of his doctored coffee and grimaced, turning and tossing the phone onto his small kitchen table. It clattered loudly. He'd gotten up a little late this morning, well, actually a lot late, so he missed the first two rounds of the festival. The festival was always set up so that those two events took up the morning, leaving the afternoon free for the inevitable tournament. 
As he took his taiyaki out of the microwave and headed back to the couch, the announcers on the TV were going over a highlight reel of the morning. Sitting down on the worn piece of furniture, they were babbling on about that one first-year class in particular that had survived a villain attack. Apparently they were doing well. Sorohiko supposed that that was good. A low-stakes competition like the sports festival was likely a relief after that mess at the USJ. Sinking his teeth into his first taiyaki, he leaned back in his seat and crossed his legs as the screen was filled by a hastily slapped-together highlight reel. He was only half paying attention as the reel began, beginning to mentally go over his patrol for later this afternoon when a flash of a massive, swollen arm caught his eye and he choked on his mouth full of food. Because there, on the screen in front of him, with the announcers chattering away about how impressive he was, was a smaller, dark-haired version of Nana's murderer. Catching the pieces that fell from his mouth and painfully swallowing, he couldn't tear his eyes away from the boy's progress across the screen as the reel went on. Smashing through a zero-pointer, jumping over the top of the stadium, running around the pitch with the team, throwing his first opponent in the traditional third-round tournament out of the ring by her hair all while the announcers babbled on about how the boy had gotten in with the highest score in the entrance exam. Sounding so proud like they were the ones that raised him. God. Had Tashinori seen this boy? Had he seen the way his arms swelled up like his head? The boy's hair was green rather than white but that resemblance did he realize, he had to realize. His phone buzzed on his table again, drawing his horrified gaze to it. Putting his cup down, Sorohiko stumbled towards it, picking it up with trembling hands. Twenty-three texts and eight voicemail messages greeted his eyes, all mixed together and all from night eye. Scrolling back to the first text, he saw that there was a file attached. As if he was hypnotized, he opened it and saw a clip, longer than the one that had been in the reel, of the boy jumping over the top of the stadium, his arms swelling as he clapped them together to slow his fall. His phone buzzed again, showing the alert that someone was trying to call him again. Sir Knight, I was trying to call him again. He answered. You've seen the video I sent you? The man said without preamble, his voice tight. Who the hell is that kid? Sorohiko demanded, ignoring the niceties of conversation as well. He looks like a fucking clone. Of him, yes, I noticed. Naitai's voice was grim. Does Tashinori know? Has he seen? He has. He hadn't thought it was possible. But Naitai's voice had become even grimmer. He says that it's a coincidence. That he's a nice boy. Sorohiko scrubbed at his forehead. Fucking hell. Precisely. There was the sound of keys being tapped. I'm working on a plan to get closer to him and find out what's going on, but I'm going to need help. Sorohiko grimaced. My help? The tapping paused for a moment before resuming. If at all possible. Sorohiko wasn't the fondest of Sir Night Eye. He was a busybody and liked to insert himself into things that weren't his concern. But with Tashinori apparently ignoring the danger that was right in front of him. Of course, he said, going back over to the couch and sitting back down. What do you need? Chapter 18 Shame was already curdling in Shuto's stomach as he exited the pitch, and only got worse as he saw who was waiting in the tunnel for him. Endeavor his flame mask flickering around his eyes, scowled as Shudo came closer. We need to talk, he demanded more than said. Shuto averted his eyes and kept walking. I won. There's nothing to talk about. By throwing a temper tantrum, Endeavor sneered. Well, at least the shame was becoming anger. That was a more comfortable emotion for Shuto to feel in his gut. I ended the fight quickly and overwhelmed him entirely. You have nothing to complain about. He was almost past his father now. If he could just make it to the waiting rooms. No such luck. The familiar feeling of one of Endeavor's large hands clamping down on his arm hard enough to bruise stopped him. The heat coming off of Endeavor's body was smothering as Shudo was pulled back like a doll to face him. Shudo didn't flinch back at it, too used to it after a lifetime of facing it daily. But he didn't hide the twist of his lips as he glared up at his father. You didn't use your fire. Endeavor growled. Shudo didn't even bother to hide his eye roll. This again? I've told you, I don't need your power to reach the top. The hand on his arm tightened even further, but Shuto didn't let it show on his face how much it hurt. It wouldn't have mattered anyway. You are wasting your talent, the large man hissed. You are my masterpiece, Shudo, 
and it's about time that you outgrew this tantrum of yours. A sharp flicker of anger, like the flames that he hated so much, lanced through Shuto's chest. He wrenched his arm out of his father's grip and stepped away, glaring at him with all the venomous hatred he could muster. It's not a tantrum. I don't need your quirk to win and I never will. Turning on his heel, he began to walk away, stiff-legged with rage. Now if you wouldn't mind, I need to prepare for my next match. Shudo, don't you dare walk away from me. Endeavor snarled, but Shudo ignored him. Walking quickly, he turned the corner, secure in the knowledge that Endeavor wouldn't risk following him and causing a scene. Now though, as he headed towards the waiting room set aside for 1A, other thoughts began to bubble up. His next match. He checked the matchups and knew who he'd be going up against. Midoriya Izuku. His first friend. On the first day of school, Shudo hadn't been very impressed by the majority of his classmates. The way they chattered and giggled with each other, it was something that was completely alien to Shudo, whose world, never large, had narrowed down to just Endeavor's house after his mother's breakdown. No school or friends for Shudo, only training and his father's lectures about his purpose and glorious future of beating all might. It hadn't hurt as much as it might have. It wasn't like he'd ever had friends even before he'd been pulled out of school anyway. Sure, some of the other kids in his elementary school classes had tried, but Shudo had never been allowed to blow off training. One time, Shudo had tried, going off with a group to look for frogs in a nearby park. His father's fury and the blows his mother had taken for the crime of acting like a child had thoroughly cured any desire in him to disobey. After being pulled out of public school, the desire for friends had only faded further. Watching the other kids in the neighborhood pass by his house from his window as he iced his bruises and sprains, Shudo had found himself growing to resent them. Resent how they laughed with each other, complained about homework, excitedly talked about how cool Endeavor was, how cool it was that this or that friend lived so close to the number two hero in Japan. Those were things he'd never had. Things that he never wanted, he had tried to convince himself. Things that he tried to ignore on that first day, as groups quickly formed, filling the air with laughter and talking. It was a little easier to pull up that shield of disdain once they were on the pitch, at least. Watching the others go through the exercises, he'd welcomed the irritation he'd felt as they struggled to get through them. This was Yui, the top hero school in the country, and they were struggling with basic fitness? Letting it shield him from the awkward twist in his chest as he watched the others so easily talk to each other, cheering each other on. Until the final exercise. The ball toss, where Midoriya Izuku had been picked out from the crowd by Aizawa sensei and called to task for not giving his all. Where Midoriya Izuku then blew them all away with a throw that was on par with All Might's strength. That, Shudo thought as he entered the waiting room and sat down, was where his interest had started. Just a little twist in his chest. After all, that sort of power was definitely the sort of thing he'd have to watch out for if he was going to be number one. The second day, though. That was when it had shifted to something more. Something that snuck behind his defenses and gripped his mind tightly. Shuto knew that he had been somewhat cold towards Urarika that day, but even with that twist of interest at Midoriya's strength, he hadn't been expecting much. Honestly, he'd been more worried about Yairoza and her quirk. Strength quirks were common, after all, and rarely trained well enough to be a threat to a hero. Most villains and heroes with that sort of quirk relied totally on overwhelming their opponent, something that Shuto could return with interest. But Midoriya was not most people. The way he had moved, the way he had shifted between forms and darted about the room with his quirk made Shuto feel like he was looking into a mirror. People who had taught themselves how to use their quirks didn't move like that, with that assurance and confidence. And just like that, the suspicion blossomed. In the nurse's office, the words tumbled from his lips, a hopeful question spilling out of him. Was Midoriya like him? It was such a small thought only four words long, but it dominated his mind as he walked home that day, as he ate dinner, as his father trained him, berated him, hid him. Did Midoriya know what this was like? Did Midoriya's father see his quirk and start training him right away, when he was still small and longed to play outside with the other children? Did Midoriya know what it was like to lie on the floor with his cheek being burned by his own vomit? Did he know what it was like to cover up bruises and burns whenever they had to go out to avoid questions? Did he listen to his mother sobbing at night after her husband had beaten her for trying to give him some small bit of a childhood? Suddenly, 
Midoriya was all he could think about. But it had been years since he had truly tried to talk to someone his own age, or outside of his family. Part of him was afraid that if he did his father would pull him out of school again if he showed too much interest, but more of him knew that that wouldn't happen. It wouldn't fit the story that had been built up in his father's head over the years for him not to graduate from the best school in Japan. So he found himself trying to look up how, exactly, someone made friends. Time with computers was strictly limited by Endeavor at his house, and he wasn't allowed a phone, so simply looking up how to make a friend was out. Instead, Shudo found himself forced to sneak into his sister's room when Endeavor was out at work. He'd heard her on the rare occasions when they were allowed to eat together, talking about this or that book or drama, how close the characters were to each other, so her collection had seemed like the best place to start. She had a television in her room, thankfully, so he didn't have to risk watching things in the main living room, and books were easy enough to sneak into his book bag to read at school. Watching the dramas and reading the books had opened a whole new world to him. With a hunger he hadn't realized he'd been feeling he devoured it all, starved for depictions of the friendship that he never had the chance to feel. People, kids his age, walked across the screen and the pages of his books, laughing and playing and trusting others in a way that made his heart ache. He wanted that. He wanted that with someone who understood. Someone who had to understand. Someone like Midoriya. So Shudo had tried. He wrote down in his notebooks how the people in the books and dramas made friends, the simple little gestures that just seemed to refuse to come naturally to him, and started trying them out. Eating lunch together had been the first thing. The books and dramas seemed to think that walking up and introducing yourself on the first day was the best way to go about it, but several said that doing so after the first day was okay too. So Shudo had gotten his lunch, screwed up his courage, and walked over to Midoriya's table where he had already been sitting with his other friends. Thankfully, Midoriya's other friends hadn't tried to shoo him away, and Midoriya hadn't seemed unhappy to have him there in the days afterwards, even trying to draw him into his friend's conversation occasionally. Shuto wasn't much of a conversationalist, but they didn't seem to hold his short answers against him, so he counted it as a success. After that, he had put his other plans into motion. Working together during group work, success. Saving him a seat during practical lessons, success. Defending him from bullies, success. Even if Midoriya had apparently only just realized that Shudo was trying to be his friend right then. All in all, Shudo felt quite happy with the results of his campaign. He had a friend, one that he'd made all by himself, for the first time in his life. A friend that he would now be fighting in the next stage of the sports festival tournament. Shudo wasn't quite sure how he felt about that. It was a tournament, so there wouldn't be any hard feelings, right? Only, fights were always serious in his reference materials. No. No, they were both here to do their best, like Midoriya had said in his speech. This fight was a chance for them to show what they were made of. A loud crackle over the loudspeaker in the room pulled Shuto out of his thoughts. Todoroki Shuto and Midoriya Izuku to the pitch, please. A voice droned. Your match is up next. Shuto blinked in surprise and looked at the clock hanging above the door. To his surprise, he realized that he had been just sitting here, waiting, through the other matches. Well. Standing up from table, he pushed his worries back down in his mind. It was time for him to show everyone, especially his father, that he only needed his mother's power to be number one. Everything else could wait until later. Including his friendship with Midoriya. All right, everybody. It's the match you've all been waiting for since their explosive entrance in the first round. Todoro Kai Thayai versus Midoriya. The crowd cheered as Shuto left the tunnel leading to the pitch, so loud that he was tempted to cover his ears. He didn't though. He knew that his old man was watching somewhere. If he showed weakness, then he'd catch hell when they got home, regardless of the results of the match. Of course, he'd catch hell anyways for not using his left side, but that wasn't important. He was used to that type of hell. Reaching the steps up to the ring, he began to climb them. As he came up to the top, he could see Midoriya across the cement platform, mirroring his actions. His head was tilted down, chin resting against his chest and brow furrowed in thought. Probably trying to come up with a strategy, something that Shudo should have done while waiting, he realized with a pang of irritation at his father. Well, if Midoriya was looking like this now then he probably hadn't done much planning either. Perhaps Shudo would be okay. 
On one side, we have the powerful, the clever, the chivalrous, Midoriya Izakura. Midnight, standing on a scaffold up above them, gestured towards the green-haired boy with her whip as the screen above flickered, showing Midoriya's picture to everyone that was too high up in the stands to properly see him in the ring. No doubt Endeavor was studying the picture closely, Shudo thought with annoyance, before shoving the thought away. He had to focus. Ayanan on the other side, son of the number two hero himself. Shuto grimaced, dark thoughts rising back up before being shoved back down with twice the ruthlessness. Todoro kai thayai shitu. The crowd had already been cheering as they came out, but as present Mike finished they roared. Shuto hid his desire to cover his ears by settling into a ready position. Across from him, Midoriya did the same. It seemed that they were both resigned to the fact that only one of them would be moving on to the next round. All right, Midnight said, cracking her whip to get both of their attentions. I know you two are rather high-spirited, but don't get carried away here. Remember, at the end of the day, this is a tournament, not a fight to the death. She paused, clearly waiting for some sort of acknowledgement of her words. Shuto, keeping his eyes on Midoriya, nodded shortly. Midoriya did the same. Got it. Good. Midnight raised her whip. On your marks. Shudo took in a breath and let it out, pushing his right foot forward in preparation. Get set. Midoriya squatted slightly, holding out his arms in clear readiness to let off a shockwave clap. Fight. The whip came down with a crack and the match began. Officially, that is. Either of them moved right away. The thing was, Shudo knew as he watched Midoriya's every twitch, the thing was that they had already fought against each other in the battle trial. They'd watched each other's matches against their respective opponents. Correspondingly, they both knew each other's moves. And correspondingly, had at least a pretty good idea on how to counter them. Midoriya's shockwave claps were a major problem for Shuto. With his ice, his fighting style depended on large walls or spears, things that Midoriya had proven to be able to disintegrate with a well-aimed shockwave clap. Shuto had never used something like the iceberg from last round on the other boy, but he didn't fancy his chances of being able to overwhelm him like he had Ciro. So a long-range fight like he preferred was, not advisable, to put it mildly. Shuto was also at a disadvantage when it came to the length of the match as well. His power lowered his overall body temperature as he used it, making him vulnerable to hypothermia. Sure, technically speaking, he could use his father's fire to warm up, but something shriveled and ugly in Shuto's chest snarled at the thought of using it while his father was watching. So his options were, generally speaking, limited. With Midoriya, however, he didn't seem to have any real-time limit to his powers, or drawbacks such as harming himself. The positives of a simple enhancement quirk, Shuto supposed, but the other boy still wasn't attacking. Did he think that Shuto had a plan? Above them, Midnight cleared her throat. Ahem. I said you could start, boys. We know, Midoriya said quietly, keeping his eyes on Shuto. He shifted, lifting his foot to take a step to the side. Shuto felt himself tense, the nerves on the right side of his body tingling as he activated his quirk. Otherwise, though, he didn't move. What shot out from his foot was not impressive in the sense that Endeavor favored. It was just a thin layer of ice so thin it wasn't even really visible as it shot forward towards the area where Midoriya would have to put his foot down. But with all of the disadvantages that Shudo was at, there was one area where he felt fairly confident they were on more even ground. Midoriya put his foot down, his eyes still locked on Shudo, and slipped. His foot, which he had clearly been expecting to stay put, shot out from underneath him and forcing him into a splits-like position. This was his chance. Shudo darted forward. Both of them knew how to use their quirks and how to use them well. Both of them had to know that Shudo was at a disadvantage with his usual fighting style. So Shudo was going to have to mix it up and bring in the one area where they would both be on more even ground. Hand-to-hand -hand combat Sure, Midoriya could obviously just enhance his own strength, but hand-to-hand -hand was about more than just that. Shuto's fingers crumpled the front of the Midoriya's coat as he grabbed a hold of it. Turning, he kept up his momentum and pulled dragging Midoriya forward over his hip and into a flip. Hand-to-hand -hand was also about balance, pivot points, and technique. All things that Endeavor, shitty as he was, had emphasized after coming to terms with the fact that Shudo would never be able to bulk up to his level. 
His body type was too much like his mother's, he had grunted, not looking at Shudo, so he was better off learning a different style of martial arts. Oh, and Todoroki seems to be mixing it up. Using martial arts rather than his quirk, he flips Midoriya onto his back. Of course he did, came the tired tones of Aizawa. They've already fought each other during class training and know that Midoriya can just smash any amount of ice Todoroki throws out. It's only logical that he'd then fall back to less flashy techniques. A good point, erase her head. Ingenium, any commentary to make here? Just that this is also a good move for Todoroki to show off some of his other talents. A powerful quirk is never a bad thing in heroics, but not every situation can be solved by one. It's good to see that he has more moves than throw an iceberg at it. Dot. And another good point. Midoriya hit the ground with a gasp that should have recognized. The air had been driven from his lungs. This was his chance. If he managed to freeze Midoriya to the ground, where he wouldn't have the leverage needed to properly use his strength, he could end this match. His arm prickled as the air around them cooled. But Midoriya was clever. His eyes had been squeezed shut from being slammed into the ground, but as Todoroki sent Frost down the other boy's arms they snapped open. Clawing at the ground, he twisted, and despite Shudo's best efforts he managed to yank his arm from his grip and scuttle away, his eyes wary. Damn. Seemed like he figured out the plan. Shuto's mouth twisted slightly in irritation. Well, it wasn't like he had a better one, so he'd have to make this one work. Keeping his eyes on Midoriya, he began to send out thin sheets of ice again. This time, however, it wasn't towards any particular part of his opponent. Instead, he had it bloom outward like some great flower, aiming to cover the entire ring. Midoriya, however, wasn't just sitting around as he did so. His sleeves suddenly tightened, stretched tight by sudden muscles, and the other boy lunged forward towards him. It was an easy move to dodge, Shudo twisted, keeping his right foot on the ground. Midoriya's speed wasn't as high as he knew it could be, his feet slipping slightly on the ice beneath him. Crack. Concrete crumbled underneath Midoriya's foot as he came level with Shudo, and abruptly Shudo realized that he hadn't dodged at all. He'd just done exactly as Midoriya had expected. With his foot digging into the concrete to get past the slippery ice, Midoriya tucked in his head and squared his shoulder before body-checking Shudo hard enough to send him flying. Oh, looks like Midoriya is showing some more talents as well. Todoroki tried to ice over the ring to keep him from getting the proper leverage to fight, but that hasn't stopped him in the slightest. Using his quirk to smash through the ground, he's made his own footholds and sent Todoroki flying. Flying right out of the ring, Shudo gritted his teeth, aware that the boundaries of the ring were coming up. It was harder when he wasn't directly touching the ground but. He concentrated, his right side nearly burning from the cold he was forcing into being, but he ignored it. He was used to the cold, and right now it was the only thing that could keep him from losing. He heard a crackle and groan, ice crystals forming. Oh, and just in time Todoroki manages to get up an ice wall to keep from being knocked out of the ring. What reflexes? You're right, Mike. Reacting so fast is quite an accomplishment. I know a few people who'd have trouble thinking so fast on their feet, including me. The compliments of the announcers washed over Shuto as he wheezed. He'd hit the ice wall hard, almost knocking the breath out of himself, but he didn't have time to catch his breath. Just like during the battle trial, Midoriya was bearing down on him, his fists raised and eyes hard like emeralds. Shuto got out of the way just in time. Midoriya slammed into the ice wall, reducing it to fine powdered snow as he slid away taking advantage of the ice he'd managed to spread in order to move just a little bit faster. His chest still hurt as he stood up, but he could ignore that. What he couldn't ignore, however, was the shiver that abruptly ran through him. Gritting his teeth, he hunched over slightly in an attempt to hide it. Already? Making that wall so quickly must have taken more out of him than he expected. Midoriya was coming at him again though, so he didn't have time to linger. Throwing up a weak wall of ice, he moved again so that just as Midoriya was smashing through it he was coming around it and grabbing his arm, trying to send out more cold because he was now on a timer and needed to end this quickly. But again, Midoriya managed to wrench himself free, sliding away on the ice and shaking his arm. Shudo was shaking too, fiercer now, and he clenched his jaw in an attempt to keep his teeth from chattering. The cold was getting harder to ignore, sinking into his bones. He could feel Endeavor's fire moving underneath his skin, 
begging to be used, but he pushed it back down. He didn't need it. Cold as he was, he would win this without his father's power. Midoriya's arm was pink from the cold. So were his cheeks, making his freckles stand out. At least the temperature was affecting him as well. Shudo let out a breath, the heat forming a white mist in the chill of the air surrounding him. It was time to end this. Darting forward, he threw a punch at Midoriya's face. Yes, most of the time Shuto needed his fire to warm up, but he still had a little bit of resistance to the cold of his ice naturally. Midoriya would have none of that. If he kept his ice coming at a low but steady rate, he could send cold shooting through his opponent with every blow while minimizing his own internal temperature drop. Punch, punch, block, kick, the two of them traded blows as mist began to rise off of their bodies. It seemed that like Shuto, Midoriya's body had been trained along with his quirk. One advantage of having his body chilled already with his quirk was that the blows were numbed at least. But it was still an endurance match, and he had started off shivering. As the two of them fought, present Mike screaming his commentary from above, Shudo found himself beginning to slow. Blows that he would have dodged or blocked at the start of the match began to get through, striking him hard. He ached from the cold, his skin burning and body aching. Skipping back and blowing hard, Shudo looked over Midoriya. He was shivering too, and had the beginning of a magnificent black eye. Where Shuto's blows had gotten through were bright red and almost blistering in the unmistakable signs of frostbite. His head ducked down, face hidden from view by his arms and surrounded by frost and ice, he looked almost as awful as Shuto felt. Raising his hands once more, Shuto could barely curl his hands into fists. He could see patterns of frost twining up and down his arms. But the fight wasn't over, not yet. He had to win. Todoroki, you're shivering. Shuto had taken a stumbling step forward, but stopped at the sound of Midoriya's voice. As so, he forced out through chattering teeth. Across from him, Midoriya lowered his arms just enough for Shuto to see his eyes. They weren't the glittering emeralds from earlier in the match. No, these green eyes looking at him were soft with concern. Shuto gritted his teeth and raised his trembling arms up a little higher. We're fighting. Is this really the time to worry about me? Todoroki, Midoriya said reproachfully. As Shudo was raising his arms higher, he was lowering his, revealing a worried expression. You're the one that wanted to be friends. Worrying about each other is what friends do. Not in the middle of a fight. Midoriya's face tightened and he took a step forward. That's the time that a friend should worry most, he said. Why aren't you using your fire to warm yourself up? Shudo clenched his jaw tighter and took a step back, not letting his guard down. I told you why. You're hurting yourself, though. You're almost hypothermic. He was coming closer, his face twisted with concern as his arms continued to lower. I told you! Shudo snapped. Anger and fear began to rise up in the back of his throat, and he didn't know why. I'll win without my father's power! Midoriya stopped, his head jerking back like he had been slapped. His arms dropped entirely down to his sides, but his hands were still clenched into fists. Through gritted teeth he spoke. Todoro, no, Shudo, I understand not wanting to use a power you see as rightfully belonging to someone else, he said in a trembling voice. Believe me, you have no idea how much I understand, but you're only hurting yourself. I've felt worse, Shudo snarled. The fear and anger had kept rising as Midoriya spoke and all of a sudden he just wanted it to stop. He lunged forward and slammed a fist into Midoriya's face, making him stagger back. Midoriya didn't raise his hands though, instead keeping them at his side. His fists were trembling though. Shuto, Midoriya said softly, almost too soft for Shuto to hear. Does this make you happy? What? Midoriya had ducked his head. Now his whole body was trembling, but not, Shuto suspected, with cold. Hurting yourself, he snapped, stepping closer again. Out of spite towards someone, he raised his head and Shudo saw that his eyes were shining with tears. Hurting people that care about you to spite someone that doesn't care at all. It was Shudo's turn to feel like he had been slapped. He, he stammered out. He wanted to step back again but under that teary gaze it was like his feet were rooted to the ground. He doesn't care. You told me yourself, he only sees you as a tool. Midoriya thumped his chest. Who cares what he thinks? He's an asshole. All you talk about is him, but what about the rest of your family? 
What about your friends? I care about you, and so does the rest of the class, watching you hurt yourself like this. He stopped, and sucked in a breath through his teeth. Then he let it out before speaking again, softer this time. Giving your father so much power over you, does it make you happy? Shudo's mouth seemed to have stopped working. Happiness, that was for other people in that other world. You live in a different world than them, Endeavor said as he dragged Shudo away from his laughing siblings. His chest felt tight. I'm not taking you to a doctor for this. Endeavor shouted as Shuto lay on the floor, not even shivering anymore from the cold in his bones. Stop with this tantrum and use your flames. He turned towards the door where his siblings were standing, staring at him in horror. What are you looking at? Get out of here. He tried to breathe, shaking. Your mother won't be coming back, his father said, sounding annoyed. Shuto's face hurt underneath the thick bandages, almost as much as his heart did at the casual words. God, she just had to do it. I told her that this is a crucial age. Present Mike was saying something, but Shudo couldn't hear it over the ringing in his ears. His mother was sobbing, barely able to get the words out and facing away from Shuto. The kettle was rumbling, just on the verge of boiling. I can't do it anymore. I look at them and all I see is him. Shudo wanted to say that his father didn't control him, didn't dominate his thoughts, was the reason behind his actions. But if he didn't, then why was he the center of so many of his memories? Why did Shuto do so many things based on whether or not they would make Endeavor angry? Trembling, Shuto tried to think of the last time he had done something without first thinking about how his father would react. Nothing was coming to mind. Roki-kun? Midnight was talking to him from her scaffold. Todoroki-kun, can you continue with the match? Shudo looked up at her, feeling oddly light. Across from him, Midori, no, Izuku, was looking at him with concern. Shuto? Izuku asked. Shuto looked down at his hands, almost entirely covered in frost now. They were still curled into fists, and with some effort he forced them open. Todoroki-kun? No, Midnight-sensei, Shuto finally said. I don't think that I can continue the match. Shuto? Izuku almost sounded scandalized, and Shuto couldn't help but smile. Izuku, he said, enjoying the way the other boy's name flowed over his tongue. Thank you. You've given me a lot to think about. Ah, you're welcome? Izuku replied, still looking confused. Well, in a surprise twist after all that fighting, Todoroki forfeits the match. Man, I wish that I knew what Midoriya said. Todoroki bowed respectfully towards his friend as the crowds began to cheer. Good luck with the rest of your matches, he said, turning away to head back to the stands. I'll be cheering for you. He was halfway down the steps when Izuku's voice rang out again. Shuto! Shuto paused, looking over his shoulder. Yes? Izuku's skin was still reddened from the cold enhanced blows they had traded. Clasping his hands in front of him, he looked Shuto in the eye as he spoke. Thank you he said. For listening. Shuto smiled a little. Don't thank me yet, he said. Midnight had come down from her scaffold and was now standing behind Izuku, looking at him as well. I'm still thinking about what you said. Then, with the echoes of the cheering crowds and present mixed commentary ringing in his ears, he walked the rest of the way to the tunnel that would lead him back into the stands of the stadium. His father would undoubtedly find him soon, furious over him giving up. Before he did, though, halfway down the tunnel, he paused for a moment. He was still cold, and should probably go to see Recovery Girl. Instead of heading there right away, though, he instead held up his left hand in front of him. For just a few moments, he let go of the iron control that he used to keep his left half in check. Like they had just been waiting for this chance, a few small tongues of flame appeared, licking the air and spitting out sparks. Immediately, Shudo felt the cold begin to leave him. Izuka's words, about truly leaving his father's control of him behind, he didn't think that he was quite ready to start using his flames right away, but maybe at school, where he didn't have to deal with his father's gloating? He snuffed out the flames and started walking again, heading towards Recovery Girl's office. Like he had told Izuku, he had a lot of thinking to do. Chapter 19 Ah, uh, Hisashi pouted over Inko's shoulder. I was looking forward to seeing young Todoroki's fire. To emphasize his point, he squeezed her in his arms. At least Izuka's moving forward. 
Inko was unable to keep from tensing at her ex-husband's touch. Since the sports festival had started, either of them had left the room, and Hisashi had only gotten more touchy-feely. They had started out sitting beside each other on the couch like they had before Inko had found out who he really was, but during the time between the first and second round Hisashi had pulled her closer and closer until she was sitting on his lap with his arms encircled around her. When she had first started dating him, she had found his cuddliness charming. Touch-starved as she was from a childhood spent in foster services, she'd enjoyed the feeling of another person's skin against her own. Whether just the palms of their hands or more, she had liked the warmth and solidity of his body against hers, and had spent many nights curled up in his lap as they watched, or didn't watch, TV. In the small part of her mind not carefully tracking her ex-husband's reactions, she wondered if him pulling her into his lap was a genuine sign of affection or an attempt to manipulate those memories. In the balance of things, she was fairly certain that it was the latter. Don't you think that it's nice? Hisashi asked his voice light and playful. Inko ground her teeth. Yes, she bit out. It's nice that he can show off for once. Hisashi snorted. Hardly, he said, his voice still warm. He's barely used any of the quirks I got him. I'm weeping. The sarcastic words slipped out before Inko could stop them, and she forced her mouth shut hard enough that her teeth clicked. Clenching her hands into fists, she forced back the anger that had been bubbling in her stomach for hours now. Getting mad here would only make her slip up. She had to make sure that Hisashi continued to think that Yui was aware of Izuka's parentage and was protecting him. Luckily for her, Hisashi just laughed at her sarcasm, his chest rumbling. Reaching up, he cupped her cheek, ignoring how she flinched, and turned her face to his so that their lips nearly brushed. Strange, he said mockingly as he ran a thumb along her cheekbone. I don't feel any tears. Inko pressed her lips together tightly and twisted her fingers in her skirt. She wished she had the courage to just tear the pipe from his throat, tear it out and run away as he choked on his jokes and needling comments. That would keep Izuka safe too. But she wasn't. She wasn't brave enough to do that, and face his enraged underlings that worshipped him like some sort of god. So instead, she pulled her face away from his hand and turned back to the TV, her eyes burning with tears for real now. Hisashi just laughed again pulling her back against him and resting his chin on her shoulder. I suppose that I shouldn't be so surprised by Todoroki, though. He mused. I mean, a single fight is hardly going to get through the boy's trauma. This isn't a shonen manga. Despite herself, Inko couldn't keep from turning her head just enough to see Hisashi's scarred scalp from the corner of her eye. Trauma? She could feel the scarred skin of his cheeks bunching against her neck as he grinned. I'm not surprised that you don't know he said smugly. The Heroics Commission has spent a lot of time and effort on covering it up. However, haven't you ever wondered why Endeavor's family doesn't do public appearances? Except for young Shuto there? Inko bit the inside of her cheek. It's dangerous for a hero's family to be too public, she said stiffly, even as her mind raced to catch up with Asashi's. Hisashi just chuckled, patting her belly. For some, maybe, he said. In Endeavor's case, however, it's more to keep anyone from asking where the bruises on his wife and children are coming from. Well, we're coming from, in the case of his wife. Inko knew that she wasn't necessarily the smartest person around. Her choice in romantic partners certainly proved that, but she could hardly not get it with the hints Asashi was dropping. You're claiming that Endeavor abuses his family, she said slowly. That the number two hero in Japan is a wife beater. Oh, I'm claiming nothing, Hisashi said. He turned his head, tucking his smile into the crook of her neck. She could feel it widen. Multiple people over the years have tried to expose the man. Reporters, other heroes, even his own employees. The Hero Commission has blocked every attempt. Inko was silent. Some of my own people confirmed it years back. Hisashi continued murmuring into her neck. It seems that Endeavor couldn't stand being second best but had given up on ever climbing past our dear All Might so he decided to breed himself a better hero. He snorted. The world's worst stage father, and the Hero Commission insists on protecting him instead of, say, helping his victims. Why are you talking to me about this? Inko finally said. On the TV, Cementos was smoothing the ring's floor after talking to Midnight. Hisashi nuzzled her throat, dragging what was left of his nose up to just behind her ear, laying a chaste kiss on the soft skin there. 
I'm saying this because that is the sort of person that rises high as a hero, he said, his breath puffing against the shell of her ear. This whole society that's built up around heroes, it's broken. You know it's broken, and you've put Izuku right in the middle of it. Inko continued to be silent, memories beginning to bubble up. Because Hisashi wasn't wrong. Growing up in the foster system, she'd learned quickly and firmly that heroes preferred to rescue pretty happy children that were a part of a pretty happy family that lived in a pretty happy house. They rarely bothered to help the little girl in a dirty dress that was afraid of not getting dinner the second night in a row because her mean classmates had stolen her notebooks again. At least, not if there were no cameras around. He wasn't wrong. That was the most damning thing. Izuku didn't even have the protection that Inko was pretending he did either. If he stepped wrong, if it came out that Hisashi was his father. I know I frightened you that night, Inko, he said quietly. And I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said those things. But can't you understand that I only want what's best for him? The memories of her childhood shifted at his words, allowing another, more recent one to float to the surface. Of her son sobbing, telling her that daddy's been doing something very bad and making me do it too. Grabbing a hold of the anger that that memory brought up, Inko crushed it into a dense ball and held on tight as it began to burn. What's best for him? Ice, rather than fire, dripped from her lips but burned all the same. So to you, being a crime lord is being better than being a hero. I prefer to think of myself as a philanthropist. Hisashi sighed, sounding disappointed. Someone who helps the people that are slipping through the gaping cracks of today's society. Inko couldn't keep a scoff from leaving her lips. Really now, Inko, Hisashi said, sounding even more disappointed. He gave her a squeeze. Don't be like that. You know just as well as I do that this society isn't kind to people that fall outside of the norm. People with mutation quirks, or weak quirks, or whatever society deems is a villainous quirk. What was left of his upper lip curled as he spat out the last example. When bad things happen to them, there are no heroes there to pick them back. To extend a helping hand. Can you blame me for seeing them and wanting to help? Yes, Inko bit out. Especially when you make it very clear that your helping hand didn't come free. Hisashi let out another sigh. Nothing in life is free. Heroism should be. Should be. But it isn't. He gave her a squeeze and nuzzled behind her ear again. The price the heroes demand is being a good little victim for the heroes to save, with no ugly quirks. Or relatives. I don't ask for anything so stringent. Pulling back so that his lips were brushing the shell of her ear, Inko could feel his mouth shaping the whispered words he was pouring into her ear. Tell me, he asked, his voice no longer amused in the slightest. How did you manage to convince the heroes to help you? What did you say to All Might to convince him to hide my child from me? Inko clenched her jaw. I asked him if he wanted to piss you off and he agreed instantly. She snarked even as she thought. What reason would All Might have to help Izuku? If he kept pressing, she needed an answer that would hold up to scrutiny. Hasashi growled low in his chest. Inko could feel it against her back. I assume that's you being flippant, he said, his voice flat. I can't say that I appreciate it, though. You never answered my earlier question either. What do you think the Heroics Commission is going to do to our boy if he puts a toe out of line, hmm? All Might will protect him, Inko said. She was proud that her voice didn't waver as she said it, because God knew that All Might had to hate Hisashi to reduce his face to a mass of scar tissue. Izuka wasn't his father, wasn't anything like Hisashi, but would All Might see that if the truth came out? Would anyone? Or would they just see another villain's kid? trying to reach up past his betters. On the TV, the next match was being announced. It was between a red-haired boy with a hardening quirk and a purple-haired boy from Yi's general education track. Staring at the screen as present Mike began hyping up the audience, she tried to ignore the sound of Hasashi's teeth grinding. All Mike can't protect Izuku from everyone, he said as Midnight clambered onto the referee's platform. The world will hate him for his quirk, just as it hates young Shinso. Our quirks are not pretty, shiny things to distract the masses. Just as Shinsukun's brainwash frightens people by taking away their wills, Izuku and Eyes frightens people by taking away what they consider to be their defining trait. Brainwash would be a perfect quirk for heroics if it was actually about saving people, but instead of being recommended for heroics like he should be, he's shunted off into the general education track. Just because his quirk doesn't work well for smashing robots. 
And yet here he is, Inko said steadily. Her hands were aching from how tightly she was squeezing the fabric in her hands now. Fighting to get into the heroic's track anyways, instead of being consumed by his bitterness. Just like how Izuka fought past the guilt of what you did to get him his quirks to go to Yui. She had very nearly said to apply to Yui, and cursed herself. And don't pretend that you feel bad for Shinsukuin. I saw how you were tugging your lip when you first heard his quirk. You just want it for yourself. He let out a harsh bark of laughter in her ear and fell back. You always think the worst of me, don't you? He said, not denying the charge at all. I will admit, a couple of them have caught, well, not my eye, but definitely my attention. The boy with the molecular bonding quirk as well. He sounded wistful, and then shook his head, his tubes dragging against Inko's arm. Perhaps later. In any case, the match is about to start. Let's watch. Izuku really hadn't been expecting that from to do, no, Shuto. When he'd spoken to Shuto, urging him to forget his father's expectations, he had thought that he would use his fire, or, failing that, continue attacking with his eyes. He had not expected Shuto to stare at him like he was seeing Izuku for the first time, and then forfeit. He'd been so stunned that he'd barely been able to react to Recovery Girl's scolding as she wrapped him in heated blankets. Shuto had already been gone by the time he had reached her office apparently having bounced back quickly from overusing his quirk. Izuka wasn't so lucky, and had been forced to stay through the next match, between Kakan and Urarika. At least he'd been able to watch it on the TV. The match had been good, too, despite Urarika losing in the end. Her strategy for dealing with Kakan had been magnificent, keeping him on the defensive for the entire match, and if that final attack had landed— that the other heroes in the audience hadn't been able to see where she was going with things had been disappointing, but Aizawa had thankfully called them out for underestimating her. Frankly, Izuku agreed that if the heroes that had started booing Kakan hadn't been able to see how she had been setting things up, then they really should be handing in their licenses. When Urarika arrived in the office, helped there by Ida, he told her as much. Unfortunately, it didn't seem to help. Sitting on a bed, her hands covered in bandages and her legs with a blanket, Urarika scrubbed at her face. I still lost, she croaked, refusing to look up from her lap. Nearly only counts with horseshoes and grenades. And I lost badly, he didn't even have to touch me. You heard the audience. All they're going to remember is the fragile little girl that couldn't cut it. Her voice cracked and she wiped under her nose. You're being too hard on yourself, Ida said from the opposite side of Urarika's bed, chopping the air fiercely. He had come in with Urarika having gone down to meet her as she was carried off of the pitch. Firstly, Aizawa-sensei was quick to shut such talk down. And you got to the second round of the tournament, Izuku added, leaning forward and ignoring how the blankets slipped off of his shoulders. Yui has hundreds of students, and you beat them all, with a quirk that doesn't have any immediately obvious combat capabilities. Any hero worth their salt would be impressed and glad to have you as an intern. Urarika sniffled, still not looking at either of them. You think so? She asked, her voice thick with pleading. I just, I wanted to win, and really show what I could do. Make my mom and dad proud. I'm sure you have. Ida readjusted his eyeglasses on his nose, puffing out his chest. I know that if I had put up such an excellent fight against an opponent like Bakugu, my parents would be extremely proud of me. Izuka's heart twinged at the thought of parents but he smiled encouragingly at his friend. The way you talk about your parents, there's no way that they wouldn't be proud of you, he said. Don't forget, Kakan's one of the strongest in the class, and you kept him on the defensive through the entire fight. I don't think many in our class could do that. Midoriyakuen is right, Ida agreed. Reaching over, he patted her arm awkwardly. You said that you wanted to call him on the way here. Why not do that now? Wiping underneath her eyes, Urarika finally looked up at them. Her brown eyes were still shiny, but she managed to shoot both of them a weak, trembling smile. Yeah, she said. Yeah, you know what, Itakuin? Maybe I will. Pulling back the covers, she swung her legs over the side of the bed. Without warning, Recovery Girl appeared at Izuka's elbow, making him jump. And where do you think you're going, young lady? All three of them froze. Izuka traded glances with the other two. He thought that recovery girl had stepped out. Uh, I just wanted to call my parents. Urarika pitched the explanation so that it sounded more like a question than an answer. 
Izuka cringed as the old heroine frowned. Reaching out, she patted the bed sternly. If you want to make calls, I'll bring you a phone, she said. You just spent the better part of fifteen minutes having explosion after explosion let off in your face. You are not getting out of this bed until I give you the okay, understand? But it's a private call. Urarika protested even as she pulled her legs back up onto the mattress. Then I'll pull the curtains shut. Recovery girl was unmoved. Urarika still didn't look happy, but she seemed to be able to tell that she wasn't going to be able to make the other woman budge. Ida, clearly uncomfortable with the tension in the air, cleared his throat. If you're worried about privacy, Urarika Kuen, Midoriya Kuen and I can leave. Oh no, it's all right. The unhappiness melted away from Urarika's face as she brought her hands up. I mean, I don't want to force you out of here. It's no trouble at all, Ida insisted. I actually wanted to talk to Midoriya Kuen about something before the next round starts. Izuka looked at him in surprise, his eyebrows rising. You do? He looked over his shoulder at the TV in the corner of the room and was surprised to realize that the last match had already finished. He pouted internally. He'd wanted to watch that. Ida was already getting up. Yes, he said, putting the chair back against the wall. If you'll follow me? Nervous, Izuka glanced over at Recovery Girl. If she was being this stern about Urarika. But to his surprise, she simply nodded at him. You've probably warmed up enough by now she said, gesturing to the heated blankets that had pulled around his waist. Try to keep the dramatics to a minimum in the next match, though. I don't want you back for a second time, understand? Yes, ma'am, Izuka said, getting up and bowing to her. Recovery girl sniffed but accepted his statement, and after folding the blankets up and putting them on an empty bed, Izuka followed Ida out of the room. Ida was waiting for him just outside of the door, his arms crossed over his chest and a pensive look on his face. You wanted to talk to me? His friend jolted a little, like he hadn't noticed Izuka come out. His impression was confirmed as Ida adjusted his glasses and spoke. Midoriya Kun. My apologies, I was just thinking. About what? Izuka began walking down the hallway, heading back to the pitch. His next match would be happening soon, and he didn't want to be disqualified because he was late. About your opponent in the next fight. Ida's voice was heavy like he wasn't quite happy to talk about this. I'm not sure if it's fair to warn you, but after Kurishima-kun's fight. Oh, you saw it? Izuka supposed it made sense, since from where he was sitting he had an unobstructed view of the TV. How was it? Ida pressed his lips together. It ended very quickly. He looked away. I thought that warning Kurishima-kun would make the match unfair, but Shinsa-san didn't even give him a chance to show what he could do. So, in the name of our friendship, he stopped in the middle of the hallway, turning to face Izuku. Midoriya Kun, I know that you're fond of studying quirks. Your commentary on how we use ours during class has always been very accurate and helpful. Tell me, have you managed to figure out what Shinsu's quirk is? Izuku blinked. He was worried about Shinso, the purple-haired boy that had declared war on them. I hadn't really thought about it. Thought you did say something about watching out for him? So you remember that. That's good. Ida shifted from one foot to another, looking unaccountably nervous. Like I said, I thought that warning Shinsu san's opponents ahead of time would be unfair, but a hero would seek all the information they could before getting into a fight, yes, as they would try to help their fellow heroes as well. So it would only make sense for me to tell you. About his quirk? Absent-mindedly, Izuka's brain began to churn and a hand drifted up to tug at his lower lip. It can't be physical. Otherwise, he wouldn't be so bitter about being in general studies. Physical quirks are so common that most people with one aren't offended when they meet one with a stronger one. It has to be subtle as well, considering I don't recall seeing anything strange about him, so probably a mental quirk. He trailed off, mumbling to himself. Ida didn't wait for him to finish thinking, though. It's mind control, he said flatly. Verbally triggered. If you reply to him, he has you. Verbally triggered. Wow, what an amazing quirk, Izuka said, more to himself than to Ida. His mind whirled at the knowledge. No wonder he's so bitter about not managing to get into the hero course. That sort of quirk would be perfect for hero work. Perfect for hero work? Izuka looked up from where he had been staring at the floor. Yeah, it's perfect, he said, clenching his fists in front of him. 
I mean, it pretty much automatically de-escalates any situation, the use of it in hostage situations alone. Ida was looking at him strangely. Izuka trailed off, feeling his cheeks heat. He knew his mumbling could be seen as a bit odd, but he couldn't help it. Quirks were so interesting. But then Ida's face softened, and he smiled. You're right, he agreed. It would be very good for hero work. But it's also easy to fall into. His face became serious again. No matter what Shinsukuin says, you can't answer, he urged. No matter what. If you answer him, the match is over. He'll just make you walk out of the ring. Izuka had smiled back at his friend as he agreed, but became solemn at his warning. Don't reply. Got it, he said. The PA system crackled. Midoriya Izuku and Shinso Hitoshi, please head towards the pitch. Your match is about to begin. Izuka looked up. I have to go. Ida nodded. Good luck. And remember, he's going to try and get you to speak at all costs. No matter what he says. Don't reply. Don't reply. Don't reply. Don't reply. Izuka chanted Ida's advice to him over and over in his head as he walked onto the pitch, the roar of the audience washing over him. Don't reply to Shinsu's taunts. It was hard, though, to keep from apologizing as he walked into the ring, the crowd screaming even louder in delight. Shinsu's expression was blank, but Izuka could spot the tension around his eyes. Had he received the same welcome when he had walked onto the ring? Shinso crossed his arms and looked away. Izuka winced. Apparently not. Don't reply. Don't speak to him. Ida's warning echoed in Izuka's head. Izuka should have guessed that Shinsu's power was something like that. When he had first met the other boy before the sports festival had begun, the part of him that hadn't been furious had recognized the bitterness in his voice. The raw desire to prove himself, prove everyone that had ever said that he couldn't do it wrong. He'd recognized it because he'd felt it in himself, making him apply to every hero school he could despite the little voice inside of him that said he'd never be any better than his father. And and finally, our other opponent appears, meaning we can finally start the semi-finals. Present Mike screamed over the PA system. We're down to just four students now, all of them showing that plus ultra spirit. For this match, we have the general education student that came out of nowhere, Shinsu Haidoshii. The crowd cheered. Looking carefully, Izuka could see Shinsu's shoulders relax minutely, clearly enjoying what was no doubt the rare experience of being cheered for. He didn't blame him. Izuka knew just how badly people with quirks that could be termed villainous were treated. It was where his father got a lot of his underlings, after all. And his opponent! The chivalrous, the daring, the tearful, Izuka Midoriya! The crowd howled loud enough that Izuka would swear that the ring beneath his feet was trembling. Shinsa's eyes flashed with jealousy. Izuka cringed. All right, Midnight said from her platform. You both know the rules by this point. You also know each other. She looked them over sternly, winding the strands of her cat o nine tails around her hand. I want a good, clean match, understand? From the look on Shinsa's face, Izuka had the feeling that she may have just increased the chances of the match going dirty. Though the other boy still had his arms crossed over his chest, Izuka slid into a ready stance. He didn't expect a physical attack right away, but it couldn't hurt to be prepared. Midnight's whip snapped through the air. Ready! Shinso narrowed his eyes. Set! Izuka breathed deeply, focusing on the here and now. No more time to think of his father. Go! The whip cracked through the air, and the fight began. Izuka slid into a stance, his arms held up in front of him, and made a come and get it motion. It would be best to end the fight quickly, he thought as he stood still. It would be the smart thing. Looking at Shiso, though, at the jealous twist to his lips. If he ended it quickly, then Shiso wouldn't have any time to show what he was capable of. And even if that was what he'd been doing with his opponents, it wouldn't be fair to just do that right back at him. Shinsu's eyes were still narrowed at him, his lips pressed tightly together. Really? He finally said as Izuka made no move to attack him. Am I so little a threat to you that you won't even attack me? Do you think I'm just going to give up? Izuku opened his mouth to reply but snapped it shut just before a denial could escape it. Ha! Huh. Shinsu looked away. Looks like four eyes warned you. You must be special to him, 
considering he didn't seem to warn anyone else. Izuku swallowed back another comment. The other boy's eyes glittered as he looked back at him. Still nothing. Impressive. I thought that you were the type to defend your friends without thinking, after your little tantrum when I confronted you. Tantrum, oh. Izuka shot him a look. Really? Pointing out his hypocrisy was throwing a tantrum now? Then Izuka saw Shinsa's mouth twist. Another attempt to make him speak. Maybe it had been a mistake to try and give Shinso time to show off. Shifting his weight, Izuka slipped a strength quirk into his arms. All the other boy had been doing was talking. He'd at least expected some sort of physical attack. Anything to show that he was more than just a one-trick pony with his quirk. But it seemed that he really didn't have anything other than his quirk. Izuka didn't know why he was disappointed. Though I guess it's not really a surprise. Shinso was continuing. I mean, after that pathetic excuse of a match with Todoroki. Izuka stiffened. Pathetic. After everything that Shudo had gone through, was going through, there was nothing pathetic about his friend. But Shinsa's eyes were gleaming, and Izuka realized his mistake just a second too late. Gotcha, Shinso said, his voice thick with triumph. It was like the world was suddenly muffled around Izuku. The cheers of the crowd's present mixed commentary. It was all suddenly so very far away. Shinso was still standing across from him, but he had uncrossed his arms and was looking at him smugly. When he spoke, his voice was clear and sharp, slicing through the fog surrounding Izuka's mind. Turn around and walk out of the ring. Without any input from his mind, Izuka felt his body obey. He could hear present Mike shouting and the crowd murmuring to itself, but he couldn't stop his body from continuing to obey Shinsu's command. He turned his feet scuffing against the concrete. And then he saw them. They weren't a part of the audience. No, they were standing on the pitch in a crowd, so many of them that for a wild moment Izuka couldn't figure out how he hadn't seen them before. Shadows. Figures made of darkness, spilling out from the tunnel he had come from and standing on the grass and the steps leading up to the ring, their faces too dark for him to pick out any details but their large, glowing white eyes that were staring at him. What, Izuka wanted to say as he took a step towards them. What are you? What are these? How could he tell that they were watching him? He took another step towards them. The mass of shadows meant that it was hard to pick out individual limbs, but Izuka could swear that he saw movement in the mass. Against the pale concrete of the arena, he could see arms moving, reaching out to him. His mind was racing. He should have talked to Ida more. He should have tried to talk to Kurishima and Shinsu's other opponents. Was this normal? Was this what happened to all of Shinsu's victims? Another step. Another step. Another step, and Izuka's gorge rose. The figures at the front of the crowd had become clearer. Some were tall. Some were average-sized. And some were very small indeed. No. The others wouldn't have seen this, Izuka realized as he got closer. This couldn't be a normal side effect of Shinsu's quirk because this sort of variety. These weren't just random shadows, or a hallucination. They were ghosts. Vestiges of the original owners of his quirks. He could feel it, echoes of what he felt when he was choosing what quirks to use. They were ghosts of his father's victims. Of his victims, when he was too young and too stupid to keep his mouth shut. He couldn't seem to suck in enough air through Shinsu's control of his body, but Izuka could feel his heart begin to speed up in his chest. Of course they were watching him. Of course they were reaching out to him. He'd taken their quirks, the part of them that was fundamentally them. And they wanted it back. I'm sorry, Izuka thought, I'm sorry. He still couldn't breathe enough, and his heart was just pounding louder and louder, and his ears. I'm sorry, I'd give them back if I could. Their blank white eyes stared at him accusingly. There were so many of them. So many hands now reaching out towards him, and they were moving more now shifting around each other. No, not just moving around, some of them were climbing on each other, radiating desperation. They wanted their quirks back. Izuka took another step towards them. They were climbing onto the arena now. Their grasping fingers were impossible to ignore against the pale concrete of the ring. They were crawling towards him, on top of each other, like a wave that wanted to drag him under. He couldn't see the heroes sitting in the stands now, the piles of shadows were too high, moving too much while he couldn't move at all. 
His eyes began to burn as he stepped close enough that their fingers were nearly brushing his skin. His chest felt like a drum with his heart pounding against it, and suddenly he would have done anything to keep the shadows, the victims, from touching him. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Their eyes showed no acceptance. Izuka felt like his chest was about to burst. He was so sorry, he was so so sorry for taking their quirks, and a sob was building up in his chest. Their fingers were cold against his cheeks. Cold against his arms. Cold against his throat. So cold that it burned. Izuka screamed. The noise tore out of his throat and through the air as tears gushed down his face, and the shadows disappeared. The world that had been so fuzzy outside of the shadows and Shinso suddenly snapped back into focus. Later, Izuka would realize that for the first time that day the audience had been silent. Not even present Mike had said anything as the scream echoed through the stadium, bouncing off the concrete and bodies and slowly fading. But as he turned back around to face Shinso, none of that registered with Izuku. All he could hear was the pounding of his heartbeat like a drum. All he could see was Shinso, standing there and looking like someone had hit him in the head with a bat. No more mercy. No more chances. Izuku surged forward, a strength quirk thickening his muscles. H. Hey. Shinso began to say, but Izuki gave him no more time to speak. Those shadows, he wouldn't let Shinso force him to see them again. He was on the other boy and slamming his fist into his stomach before another sound could leave his mouth. Shinso let out a noise like a deflating balloon but Izuku didn't linger. As he crumpled, Izuku grabbed the front of his uniform. It wasn't safe to hit him so hard, a small voice pointed out in the back of Izuku's mind, but he couldn't hear it over his thundering heartbeat. This time, keeping his mouth shut, Izuku twisted, pivoted his weight, and hurled Shinso not just out of the ring but into the crowd. It was rude to the heroes, but they managed to catch the other boy. Shouts were rising up, but he turned to midnight and stared at her. He still couldn't breathe, couldn't suck in enough air to ask, but he stared at her pleadingly. Her eyebrows were twisted with concern as she looked first at Shinso, being helped to his feet in the audience, and then at him. Izuka kept his eyes on her. He had to keep his eyes on her. She bit her lower lip, then raised her cat o nine tails. The winner is Midoriya. And that was all he needed to hear. His body trembling and bow rising at the back of his throat, Izuka bolted out of the ring and off of the pitch. Chapter 20 Shoyuta was standing up before Midoriya had even left the pitch, heading for the door. Once more, he sent a mental thank you to Recovery Girl for healing him enough that he could now move at a decent clip, if not enough that he could easily open a door. Cursing quietly under his breath as he fumbled with the announcer's booth door, he stopped when a hand snaked around him to turn the knob. Looking behind him for the hand's owner, he saw Tensei, his face pale and grim. Go, he said simply. Behind him, Shoyuta could see Hizashi, half-risen from his chair and just as pale as their friend. All of them had been heroes for years, now. They all knew what a scream of pure terror sounded like. Nodding at them both, Shoyuta obeyed. Half jogging down the corridor, he tried to think of where Midoriya was likely heading. The change rooms? He would know where those were, but they were on the opposite side of the stadium from where he had exited the pitch. Not to mention, they weren't very private, and terrified people tended to want to hide when they ran. More likely, then, he was heading to one of the stadium's washrooms, not the public ones, but the private ones meant for the students. His supposition was quickly proven correct as he rounded the corner towards the first set of washrooms he'd wanted to check. The crowd of his students surrounding the doorway was more than enough evidence. Most of the class had apparently come, concern radiating off of them. Todoroki was pressed up against the door, gently tapping it, with Yayorozu beside him, her eyes big. Even Bakugu was there. Despite his match starting soon, his arms crossed over his chest and brows furrowed in a worried frown. Aizawa-sensei! Yurarika called as she spotted him, her big brown eyes filled with tears. Midori-kun's not letting anyone in. We think he locked the door. We heard him scream, said Ida, chopping the air frantically as his glasses slid down his nose. We all did, Ishido said, tears streaking down her cheeks and her hands clasped in front of her chest. So we tried to find him. I'm not surprised. Shoyuta focused on keeping his voice calm. One of the first things you learned as a hero was that if you were calm, so were the civilians. If he let on how badly that scream had freaked him out, 
then there was no way that they'd listen. He seems to have had a bad reaction to Shintz's quirk. I've seen such a thing happen before. It wasn't even a lie. Mind control quirks had a bad reputation for a reason. Along with the whole controlling someone against their will, a lot of them could cause bad psychological reactions in their victims. Anxiety, panic attacks and the like were common after someone was freed from mind control. Sir, Ida said, pushing his glasses back into place. I was controlled by Shinso and didn't have anywhere near such a reaction. Are you sure that it's just? Ida, Shouyuta said sternly, even as he filed that little nugget of information away. Please trust me when I say that this isn't my first time helping someone through the post-control period. Not everyone reacts the same way to psychological quirks. He felt a little bad at how Ida stiffened, but pushed it aside. Now that he was closer, he could hear the shuddering gasps for air through the door. He needed to get in there now, before Midoriya hyperventilated himself into unconsciousness. Right now, being crowded will only make things worse. I know that you're all only concerned about your classmate, but you need to wait until I tell you that it's okay to come in, understand? Some of the children, thankfully, looked like they understood. Todoroki looked like he had bitten into a lemon, but nodded, while for a moment Shoyuta thought that Yuraraka and Ida's heads would fall off from how hard they were nodding. The others looked more unsure, but Shoyuta figured that he could probably depend on the first three to keep things under control. With that settled, he returned his attention to the bathroom door. With security concerns being what they were, several changes had been made before the festival had started. Along with regular security sweeps by other heroes, every single lock in the stadium had been changed. Master keys were made, and placed in only one other person's hands besides the principals. For the first year's stadium, Shouyuta had all but begged to be that person, desperate to feel like he was actually part of efforts to keep his students safe. Luckily for him, Nedza had been sympathetic. Pulling out the massive ring of keys that he had hidden in his bandages, he ignored the gasps of the students behind him as he counted out the correct key for the bathrooms and slotted it into the lock. With a twist of his wrist, the lock disengaged and the door opened. Behind him, the students shuffled, clearly resisting the urge to storm in, but he ignored them as he stepped into the small room, closing the door behind him. The washroom resembled pretty much every industrial washroom he'd ever been in. A plain tiled floor, sinks with mirrors bolted to the wall, and the walls painted an ugly off-white that clashed with the green of the stalls tucked into the corner. It stank heavily of floral-scented cleaners and... Shouyuta grimaced as the sound of retching met his ears. He didn't need to move from his place by the door to see Midoriya's shoes poking from the stall closest to him, trembling from the force of his own vomiting. That was not a good sign. The retching ended, quickly replaced by a short, choking sobs. Stepping away from the door, Shouyuta walked the short distance to the stall, noting that Midoriya had been in too much of a hurry to even close the door behind him. Despite having won his last match, Midoriya looked nothing like a winner right now. Kneeling in front of the white toilet, his shoulders shaking, the boy looked like a house of cards on the verge of collapse. The sour smell of vomit was thick in the air, so thick that Shouyuta suspected that Midoriya hadn't made it all the way to the toilet before the first wave of vomit had escaped him. Aizawa, sensei. Midoriya croaked after a minute. As sorry. You have nothing to apologize for, Shouyuta said, cutting the boy off. Best to nip that sort of thing in the bud. I, I must have, I threw Shinsaku in. Midoriya swallowed, the noise loud in the quiet of the bathroom. I scared everyone, didn't I? No. Shouyuta tried to gentle his voice. He'd always been better at apprehending villains than soothing civilians but that didn't mean he was completely hopeless. Scared for you, maybe? Every hero knows the difference between a scream of victory and a scream of terror. Then you ran off. He shrugged, trying to keep things seeming casual and normal so that the boy's fear had nothing to play off of. Midoriya coughed, hacked, and spat something into the toilet. That's not much better, he mumbled. But his trembling was smoothing out, and his voice was steadier. You were... You were with Peasant Mike, in the announcer's booth, and I made you come all the way down here. I'm your teacher, Shouyuta said, cutting off his self-deprecating words again. While you're in this school, your well-being is my concern and comes before hanging out in any announcer's booth. Midoriya spat again. Still, he mumbled. Looking at him carefully, Shouyuta judged that he had probably calmed down enough now that he could approach him without making him panic. 
Stepping towards him, he bent over at the waist with a low grunt and laid a bandaged hand on the boy's back. This, he said, keeping his voice firm but gentle, coming and finding you is not a problem. What is a problem is what caused that reaction in the first place. Even through the bandages, Shoyuta could feel Midoriya tense. Would you like to talk about it? Midoriya didn't answer. Crouched in front of the toilet, his hands gripping its sides, he didn't so much as move for a long set of heartbeats. Then he abruptly stood up. Shoyuta immediately let go and backed up. He should have waited, he cursed himself. This isn't some demand that you tell me what was going on there, he said. I misspoke. I just want to know if whatever caused that is something. My dad. Shoyuta closed his mouth as Midoriya choked out the words, his voice rough. My dad, he repeated. I couldn't. Shinsukun was making me. His mouth shut with an audible click, and he swallowed loudly once. Twice. Then he was falling back down to his knees and loudly emptying what was left of his stomach into the toilet. Distantly, Shoyuta noted that his hands left smears on the gleaming porcelain. That explained the smell. Midoriya gagged, choking back what sounded like a sob as his shoulders began to shake again. He was gasping, now, sounding like he was about to tip over the edge into true hyperventilation. Shuida stepped forward, placing a hand back on the kid's back. This, at least, he couldn't mess up. Midoriya, concentrate on my voice, all right? Just concentrate on doing what I tell you. You need to take in a deep breath. He let himself fall into the comfortable rhythm of guiding someone through a panic attack, mindlessly mouthing the instructions to steady Midoriya's breathing, and wondered at the kid's words and reactions. For all that he had said outside of the bathroom to the other students, this sort of reaction wasn't actually normal. Yes, he had seen reactions like this before, that much was true, but they had usually been from people who had been controlled for long periods of time, not just a minute. People who were only controlled for a short period were shaken, but not to the point of vomiting and hyperventilating. My dad. I couldn't. The worlds curled around Shuda's head, heavy and thumping and leaving imprints in his mind. They were important, he could sense that. They were the key to this. Maybe the key to other things as well. Looking down, he could see that Midoriya's knuckles were still white on the toilet seat. Midoriya hated his quirk and called it ugly. He had the feeling that he would be spending some time after this taking a closer look at Midoriya's records. Finally, after several very long minutes, Midoriya's breathing had settled down to the point that Shoyuta felt comfortable slowing it down on the instructions. For a minute more, they just stood there, half in and half out of the stall, Shoyuta rubbing the boy's back as he shuddered, whimpering like a kicked puppy as he fought to get himself back under control. Distantly, he could hear the sound of the crowd cheering and Hizashi's muffled commentary. Outside of the bathroom, he could hear the group that had followed Midoriya to the bathroom murmuring to each other and moving around. Rubbing the boy's back, he kept his voice low as he asked, Are you feeling better? Midoriya sniffled. Yeah, he mumbled. I'm sorry. Never be sorry for being afraid, Shoyuta replied, still keeping his voice gentle. Even the best heroes get scared. Lifting his hand away from the soiled toilet, Midoriya wiped his eyes when the back of his forearm. Even all might? Of course, Shoyuta replied. Now, do you feel you can stand up? Midoriya nodded, his head flopping back and forth like it was barely attached to his body. As he slowly stood up, Shoyuta kept a hand on his shoulder, still able to feel the tension on it. Once he was on his feet, he gently guided him out of the stall and towards the sinks. Midoriya was holding his hands out and away from his body allowing Shoyuta to see the streaks of vomit stuck in the creases. Um, I kind of started throwing up on the way here, Midoriya mumbled as they reached the white sinks. I, I managed to catch most of it, but I think some of it might have fallen. The janitors will take care of it, Shoyuta said. Reaching past Midoriya, he turned the tap on. You should focus on cleaning yourself up right now. Even if, judging from the paleness of the boy's reflection, there wasn't much that splashing water on his face would help with. Wash your hands and rinse your mouth. There was a roar from outside. The fight must be going well. Hizashi was yelling about something, at least. The words were too muffled to make out. Obediently, Midoriya began to wash his hands. He looked up at the noise leaking into the room, though, his brow furrowing. Tea the next match already started? I didn't realize that I'd been in here for so long. 
Looking back down at his hands, he scrubbed them a little harder. He had started trembling again. I, I really should hurry up, shouldn't I? Everybody's going to want a good fight for the finale. Shoyuta didn't answer right away. Midoriya was scrubbing furiously at his hands now, leaving red streaks on his palms. Outside, there was another cheer. Need to make a good show. Midoriya was mumbling. Gotta pull it together and give everyone a good show. He cupped his hands underneath the faucet and splashed water on his face before taking a mouthful and swishing it around his cheeks. Spitting it out, he reached jerkily for a paper towel to pat dry his face. You know, Shoyuta said. People have withdrawn from matches before. Midoriya froze. What? he asked, turning his head to look at him with wide eyes. Shoyuta squeezed his shoulder. People have withdrawn from matches before, he repeated. They felt that they weren't in the right headspace, or were otherwise unable to make a proper showing in their match, so they forfeited to their opponent before the fight began. Midoriya swallowed. You think I should withdraw? He said. You just spent the past half hour crying and throwing up in a toilet, Shoyuta said gently. You're still trembling, even now. I think that if you go out there right now, you're unlikely to properly show your capabilities. But you and all the other teachers, you were saying how this was our big chance to show off for the pros. In the first round, you jumped over the top of the stadium, Shoyuta interrupted. In the second, you had one of the most exciting battles with Bakugu's team. You talked your one of your opponents into quitting the match to preserve their health, and helped another to recovery girl. He squeezed the kid's shoulder again. You've more than made an impression during this sports festival, and every hero here knows what a terrified scream sounds like. No one will blame you for excusing yourself from a fight because you're not mentally at your best. Midoriya turned away from him and stared at himself in the mirror, his throat working as he swallowed. I, can I think about it? Of course, Shoyuta said. He let his hand drop from Midoriya's shoulder and stepped back. In the meantime, though, your friends are waiting outside. If you'd like, talk it over with them. They were quite concerned about you. Midoriya had looked up sharply at the mention of his friends, and his mouth quivered as Shoyuta told him how concerned they were. They came to find me? He asked meekly. Shoyuta jerked his head towards the door. They've been right outside all this time. He shuffled towards it. Just think about it. You have two more festivals as well. There's no need to burn yourself out in your first year. And in a surprise twist, the announcer was saying, It seems that Midoriya has decided to forfeit the match without a fight, or even an appearance. Boy, that Shinso kid's quirk must have really rattled him. Inko relaxed right as Asashi made a disappointed noise burying what was left of his face into the crook of her neck. Ah, uh, I wanted to see him fight Bakugakuin, he complained. I'm just glad that he's apparently okay, Inko replied tartly, tensing right back up. The way he ran off. Our boy is strong, Hisashi said, raising his face a little. I won't deny that his reaction to Shinsukuin's quirk was strange, but nothing so petty would have stopped him. He squeezed her hand in what would have been a comforting gesture a few years ago. Then there was a knock at the door behind them. As Hisashi turned his head towards the noise, Zinko pulled her hand away from him, her skin crawling. Come in, Hisashi called, seemingly not taking offense at her actions. The door creaked open, letting in a beam of light. Master, Kurojiri said. Stepping in, Inko could see his mist curling off of him in agitation. I'm aware that you did not wish to be disturbed, but we just received the news. We found it dot. Underneath her, Inko felt Hisashi straighten. Our friends were successful, then? He said eagerly. It was only the shift in the position of Kurojiri's eyes that let Inko know he was nodding. Yes, master. I took the liberty of gathering together some of the others in preparation of your move. Hisashi grinned, the scar tissue of his face warping grotesquely. Excellent. Let them know that I'll be joining them. Kurojiri's eyes widened. Master? Hisashi's arms wrapped back around Inko as he abruptly stood up. Letting out a little noise, she automatically flung her arms around his neck to steady herself. Underneath her, his chest rumbled. You know that this is something near and dear to my heart, he said lightly, setting Inko down so that she was standing before straightening again and smoothing down his front. Of course I'm going. Before I do, though, would you mind escorting my dear Inko back to her rooms? 
Before Kurojiri could say anything, though, a scratchy voice piped up. I'll do it, sensei. Inko sucked in a soft breath as the speaker stepped into the room, revealing himself. Shaggy white hair. Red eyes. Scratching at his neck. Tamira-chan, she said softly. She'd first met the little boy when she was pregnant with Izuku. She'd gone to Hisashi's supposed office to meet him for dinner, only to find the white-haired boy sitting in a chair outside, hunched over and scratching at his neck. Maybe it had been the hormones. Maybe it had just been instinct. Either way, Inko had quickly found herself sitting down beside the little boy and smiling at him. She'd asked how he was doing, and he'd seemed so surprised by her concern that her heart had broken. Hisashi and Kurojiri had come out of the office to find her listening patiently to the plot of the latest game Tamura-chan had been playing. The boy had been introduced as Kurojiri's foster son, who'd come to live with him after his father had had an accident. Just like that first time they'd met, Tamura-chan smiled shyly at her from underneath the curtain of his hair. Hello, Inko-sama, he said. Inko swallowed. Hello, Tamura-chan, she said softly. She'd wanted to take him with her and Izuku when they ran. She'd wanted to, but Kurojiri had kept a close an eye on him for her to be able to, so she'd cut her losses and ran. And now she was seeing the effect of that in front of her. He was so thin. His neck had already had marks by the time she had run, but now it was covered in scars and fresh wheels. Bandages were peeking out from underneath his shirt. And neither of the men in the room were reacting to his appearance at all. She curled her hands into fists. Oh, Tamira, Hisashi said casually. Did you lose interest already? Tamira just shrugged. All the interesting fights are done now, he muttered, still scratching at his neck. And I wanted to talk a little with Inko-sama. Hisashi hummed to himself for a moment, cocking his head to one side. Then he smiled. All right. I suppose that I can allow that. Before Inko could react, his arms snaked out and pulled her against his side. Bending slightly, he pressed a kiss to the top of her head before stepping away again. Don't dawdle, though, Tamira. I'd like your company for this as well. Yes, sensei, Tamira said. Stepping further into the room, he hesitantly held out a hand to Inko. Biting the inside of her cheek, Inko took it. The little smile that played across Tamira's face almost made the whole situation feel okay, she noted. Kurojiri's mist billowed out, surrounding them. Automatically, Inko closed her eyes and gripped Tamira's hand tighter. The feeling of falling overwhelmed her for a moment, before she felt solid ground beneath her feet. Tamira's hand was warm in hers, the pinky held away from her flesh. We're here, he said unnecessarily. Inko let out a breath and opened her eyes. Thank you, Tamira-chan, she said. The hallway was offensively normal. It could have been from any high-end hotel with a plush carpet that her shoes sank into and ornate decorations on the walls. It made her want to spit that Hisashi would lock her up here. Tamura scratched his neck again and tugged gently at her hand. This way, he said quietly. Inko didn't reply, but followed him as he began to walk. The carpet swallowed the sounds of their footsteps, deepening and widening the silence between them as they walked back towards what Inko assumed was her prison. Only the rasp of Tamira's nails against the skin of his neck broke it, filling the air. Until Tamira spoke. Um, he mumbled. I was watching the sports festival too. Inko swallowed. Were you? Yeah. Tamira paused for a moment, like he was gathering his thoughts. I saw your son. Izuku. He was really good. Another pause. I think he could have one against that Bakudu kid. Katsuki-kun. Inko hoped that her son's old friend was supporting him with her gone. Maybe. I was more worried about him after his reaction to that Shinso boy's quirk. Ah, yeah? Scratch, scratch, scratch. That was kind of scary, wasn't it? Scratch, scratch, scratch. Makes you wonder why no one went after him to make sure he was okay. I'm sure that one of his teachers did, Inko said, forcing her voice to stay steady. There were more than just the two on the pitch present, after all. Tamira grunted, still scratching. If Sensei had been there, though, he said darkly, there'd be no question. He would have made sure that Izuku was okay. Inko pressed her lips into a tight line. It must be driving you nuts, leaving him in the hands of the heroes. Tamira continued, not looking at her. 
without protection, or anyone that actually cares about him. Risking a glance out of the corner of her eye, she thought that she saw blood on his fingertips. But don't worry, he said. Sensei has a plan. He's going to get Izuka back safe and sound. A plan? The words slipped out from her mouth as a chill ran down her spine. Back there, she had thought that Kuro Jairi's interruption had been for normal business. Tamira stopped scratching, letting his blood-stained hand fall back down to side as he turned to look at her. Yeah, he said innocently. I don't know all the details yet, but he's got an idea on how to get him away from those heroes. He turned back away. That thing that he was looking for, it's going to bring us one step closer to getting Izuku to come home. A yawning pit opened up in Inko's stomach. She couldn't speak, her tongue gluing itself to the top of her mouth. A plan. He had a plan. She'd thought that saying that the heroes knew would protect Izuku. Idiot. Idiot. She scolded herself. Of course he'd still be trying to get him back. He always gets what he wants. Ah. Uh, ain't San. Inko was pulled from her thoughts by the sound of someone new calling for her. Looking up from the carpet. Her eyes widened at the group of people she saw. A group of very familiar men were standing up from the table they'd been sitting at, the clear signs of gambling scattered across it. There was the smell of cigarettes and coffee hanging heavy in the air, and a small TV playing in the corner. It was the award ceremony for the first years at Yui. Her son was standing on the second-place podium, Katsuki-kun glaring down at him from first place. She knew these men. She'd known them for years. They were the security team from the compound that she'd lived at, back when she hadn't known what Hisashi was. She'd liked them, made cupcakes for more than a few when she knew it was their birthdays. Oh, she stammered. Hello, Yamamoto-san. She searched her memory. How's your wife been doing? Did you manage to make up with her? Yamamoto beamed, his dark blue hair falling in his eyes. She's doing great, he said happily. Your advice really worked. Inko smiled. That's good, she said, hoping that the stress wasn't showing on her face. The thing was, she liked these men. Had liked them. Had trusted them. And yet, here they were, clearly guarding her prison to keep her from escaping. It made something in her chest twist, to see them smiling at her. Sorry that we haven't really talked to you, ain't San. Another guard, Mitsuni she thought his name was, interjected. I mean, I wanted to at least... But we figured that with you and Master going through a rough patch, you might not really welcome us, you know? A rough patch. A rough patch? Inko bit back a hysterical laugh. Was that what Hisashi was calling it? No. No. She wouldn't concentrate on that. She wasn't going to concentrate on the hole in her guts that had formed at the realization that Hisashi was still gunning for Izuku. She was going to concentrate on the fact that these people guarding her thought that she and Hisashi were just going through a rough patch, and the possibilities that that opened. Still smiling, she shook her head. Ah, uh, no, she said. I mean, I understand why you'd think that, but being alone, it leaves me with just my thoughts, you know. A bit of conversation would be nice, just to mix things up. Several of the guards grinned in genuine happiness. We'll be sure to do so, ain't San? Yamamoto assured her. They were so quick to take her at face value, Inko thought as she looked over their smiling faces. Even Tamira looked calm, content to let her talk to the guards before ushering her back into her cell. The hole in her gut was still there, but as she looked at them, it grew a bit smaller. I can work with this, she thought. I can use this. The men chatted away with her, complimenting her on Izuku's performance, and expressing worry for abrupt departure after the match with Shinso. They were all just as happy to see her as when she had truly been with Asashi. They were still calling in San as a mark of respect. Yes, she thought, I'm going to manipulate the shit out of all of you. After all that had happened that day, all of the emotional highs and lows, and the image of the shadowy ghosts he had seen chasing his thoughts, Izuku was dead on his feet as he walked through the door into Hakucho and Nebisu's small apartment and turned on the lights. Sitting down, he began to take his shoes off. Congratulations. Izuku jumped nearly a whole foot into the air as poppers went off, filling the air with confetti. Ah. Uh, w what? He stammered out, nearly tripping over his own feet as he whirled around. Hakucho and Nebisuk were standing in the doorway leading to the rest of the apartment, grinning and holding poppers. Hey there, champion! 
Nebisuk said, sounding more enthusiastic than Izuku had ever heard her sound before. CH champion? Izuku questioned, shaking his head to loosen some of the confetti that had gotten caught in his curls. I'm not the champion, I came in second. Only because you had to step back for your health, Hakucho said, interrupting him. His feathers flared out from his jaw. There's no shame in taking care of yourself. Everyone on the TV was saying it, and saying that you were showing the sort of good judgment that heroes should have, rather than trying to bull through it, and possibly failing at the worst moment. Izuka rather doubted that, but didn't say anything as warmth bloomed in his chest. Kicking off his shoes, he allowed himself to be guided into the main room of the apartment, where a small cake was waiting on the table, a few half-melted candles stuck into it haphazardly. Taking a seat with them, he blew it out as they chanted an old song about how they were all champions of something. After cake was more celebration, and watching the news as they went over the events of the day, Izuka blushed every time he was mentioned, which was a lot. Highlight reels of him and Shuto jumping over the top of the stadium, and the final seconds of the cavalry battle came up a lot. Him helping Shiozaki off of the field and Todoroki forfeiting to him came in a close second. Nebisuk and Hakucho argued over whether or not he could have a few sips of beer, with Hakucho surprisingly winning the argument for no. Eventually, though, the celebrations wound down. They had the next day off from school to recover from the sports festival, but that didn't mean that Izuka wasn't tired now. Saying goodnight, Hakucho went off to his own room, and Nebisuk went down to the cafe in her cubicle. He was left alone in the main room of the apartment, with the lights turned off and the black of the night pressing in alone, with his memories of what he'd seen today. Izuka shivered at the memory of the shadows, goosebumps rising on his skin. Sitting down on his futon, he pulled the covers up and around him like they could protect him from the world. Those shadows, it was silly to say, but even now, he knew that they hadn't been hallucinations. His phone vibrated in his hand and lit up, making him fumble and nearly drop it in surprise. The class group chat had been going wild all night, with his classmates crowing over how they had all done. Throwing compliments and links around, they had had his phone buzzing in his pocket non-stop until he'd been forced to mute the main server. For it to be vibrate. Izuka's eyes had been feeling gritty with sleep. Now, though, he was wide awake. It was a private message. From Kaken. Izuka swallowed in a futile attempt to wet his suddenly dry throat. Kaken had been furious, back on the podium. Izuku had barely been able to stand his infuriated gaze boring into the side of his head as All Might handed out the medals, wanting nothing more than to run off the pitch again. Thankfully, he'd been able to dodge the other boy as he left, but now he was messaging him. He chewed the inside of his cheek as he debated ignoring the messages. He could just block Kaken. His phone buzzed again. Damn. No, that wouldn't work, and he knew it. He'd been trying to do so all before the festival and that had just gotten him cornered in that closet. With a sigh, he opened the messages. The light from the screen streamed across his face, revealing what Kaken had written. Bakuga Katsuki Ah, uh, dumbass, how are you doing? You seem pretty freaked out. Bakuga Katsuki Fucking asshole, don't ignore me. Midoriya Izuku Sorry, sorry, I was in bed. Midoriya Izuku I'm fine, I didn't mean to worry you. Bakuga Katsuki That's no fucking excuse, so am I. Bakuga Katsuki Also, bullshit. You're not fine. Izuka grimaced. Yeah, he'd been too optimistic. Kaken was not going to take his misdirection tonight. Midoriya Izuku I am. Midoriya Izuku I just wasn't expecting his quirk, that's all. The cursor blinked for a few seconds before Kaken answered. Bakuga Katsuki. Fucking bullshitting me again. Four eyes told us that he warned you about that purple fucker. Bakuga Katsuki. No one else had that sort of reaction to it. Izuka sighed. Midoriya Izuku. I told you I'm fine. Midoriya Izuku. I'm sorry that I didn't fight you. I just didn't think I'd be able to give you a proper fight. There was a long pause now. Longer than the previous one. That worried Izuku. Had he finally tested Kaken's patience too much? With a jolt, he remembered Katsuki's words from the closet before. If you don't stop it with this shit then I'll make you. What had he meant by that? 
Was Kakin going to tell the teachers the truth about his quirk? Izuka swallowed at the thought. His quirk was so unusual, maybe they'd just brush it off as Kakin being a sore loser? No. No, he was never that lucky. Izuka's eyes drifted away from the phone to stare into space as his mind bubbled frantically. The teachers, if ye knew, knew who he was, what he could do. He could be thrown out. He could be arrested. He'd lose his friends. Hakucho and Nebusa could get in trouble for helping him and be arrested as well. He could see himself trying desperately to explain as they all turned away from him. He could feel his father's hands on his shoulders, welcoming him home. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw something move. Izuku jerked his head to look, sweat dripping down his cheek. It was one of those shadowy figures, standing in the doorway with its hands outstretched. Izuku jumped to his feet, his heartbeat thundering in his ears, and the figure was gone. His phone chimed, and he looked down at it frantically. Bakuga Katsuki. Hey, am I your friend? His heart still hammering and breathing harsh, Izuka blinked in confusion. What? With trembling thumbs, he typed a reply. Midoriya Izuku. Of course. We've known each other forever. Midoriya Izuku. If this is about the fight, I've already told you that I didn't think I could give you a proper one. Bakuga Katsuki. This isn't about the fight. Bakuga Katsuki. If I'm your friend, why won't you let me help you? Izuku froze, his breath catching in his chest. Midoriya Izuku. What do you mean? Bakuga Katsuki. I'm not an idiot, Deku. Bakuga Katsuki. Even if the fake name wasn't a big enough clue, you freaking disappeared for five years and are pretending that you only have a super flexible enhancement quirk. Bakuga Katsuki. Which is bullshit because enhancement quirks don't cause those sorts of mutations you get whenever you let loose. Bakuga Katsuki. On top of that, your mom still hasn't called mine when they were practically attached at the hip when we were still in elementary. Bakuga Katsuki. Seriously, the hag's been complaining about it for weeks. Bakuga Katsuki. I think you actually hurt her feelings. Izuka would have laughed if this sudden line of questioning wasn't quite so terrifying. He gripped his phone tightly, hearing the plastic creak. Bakuga Katsuki. Whatever's going on, it's got you scared. Seriously scared. Bakuga Katsuki. And friends don't leave friends scared. Izuka swallowed. His eyes were burning for some reason, and his chest still felt tight, but in a different way now. His thumbs hovered over the phone keyboard. It was weird to hear someone else expressing concern about him so directly. For so long, it had just been him and his mom. And now, sure he had Nebisuk and Hakucho and all his friends in class, but none of them had really come right out and bothered him to tell them what was going on out of concern. They just let him handle it himself. Bakuga Katsuki Deku? You still there? Bakuga Katsuki I swear to fucking God if you log off after I bared my fucking heart like that I'm going to blow up your face the next time I see you. Like he wasn't in control of his hands, Izuku began to type back a reply. Midoriya Izuku. No, no, I'm still here. Midoriya Izuku. Please don't blow my face up. Midoriya Izuku. I'll tell you everything tomorrow. Chapter 21 The sun was shining, the birds were chirping and Izuku was weighing the pros and cons of throwing himself off the bridge he was waiting on for Kakin. Why had he agreed to this? Why had he agreed to finally tell Kakin what was going on in his life? This was what he got for answering those texts while sleep-deprived. God, what was he even going to say? There was no way he could just tell him what was going on. Could he? Izuka stared down at the water, chewing on the inside of his cheek. Part of him revolted at the thought of telling anyone anything, the part that remembered the empty sky and the whispers about villain's kids that he heard from his middle school classmates. Another part of him, though, whispered that this was Kakin, his best friend since he could walk, the boy that always insisted that they be heroes together, with Izuku as the number two to keep Kakin sharp in his spot at the top, the boy that made him breakfast and texted him after the fight with Shinso to make sure he was okay. But this was Kakin, he hissed at that part. Kakin, who never backed down from a fight. Kakin, who would probably go and try to fight Izuka's father if he knew what the man had done to him. 
Izuka ducked his head and ran his fingers through his hair. Even the thought of how that would end made him want to throw up. No. He had to come up with a lie for everyone's sake. To keep Kakan safe, he had to figure out what he could say to throw one of the smartest people he'd ever known off of the trail. He could do that, he told himself. He just needed a little time. Deka. Time that he did not have. Izuka jumped and whirled around. The bridge that they'd chosen as their meeting place wasn't heavily trafficked, but there were enough people around that Kakan's shout had attracted a few stairs. Cringing, Izuka tried to ignore them and paced on a smile as his brain whirled. Kakan! He said, trying to sound enthusiastic. You're early. Kakan strolled closer with his hands shoved deep into the pockets of his cargo pants and shrugged. Place we're going to fills up quickly for brunch. Now come on, I talked to them but they can only keep a private table for so long. The other boy wasn't kidding. He kept right on going and passed Izuku without pause, only turning his head to make sure that Izuku was following. Hurrying after him, Izuku quickly caught up. Oh? You know someone there? Kakan grunted, nodding and not looking him in the eye. Yeah. The owner used to be a model or something, ended up quitting and opening this place. My parents used to do her clothes for shows, so we can ask her for the more private tables. His red eyes darted towards Izuku and then away, in a way that Izuku realized was a rare show of nerves. They're not like private rooms, but they still muffle sound pretty well. Izuku smiled at him, a more honest expression this time. I'm sure it'll be great, he said. They reached the restaurant after a few more minutes of walking, and Kakin hadn't been kidding about having to hurry to keep their private table. The two-story building was packed with people, and the hostess that met them at the door was quick to usher them upstairs to a booth that was only a few decibels quieter than the crowd they had to push through. To Izuka's surprise, almost as soon as they arrived food was set down in front of them. Kakin had a meal of eggs benedict, the hollandaise sauce fragrant and mixing with the bacon and hash browns on the side, while Izuku. I called ahead while I was on the train, Kakin said, picking up his knife and fork and attacking his meal with furrowed brows. You always like that French toast stuff, right? Even after we found out it wasn't French, you always called it your favorite French meal. Taking a bite of egg and ham, he chewed it savagely and swallowed before continuing. They got this stuffed version of it here, filled with whatever you want. I told them to put in cheesecake, like your mom makes. Another bite, more savage chewing. How's she doing anyways? She wasn't too freaked out by your fights? Izuka meant to deflect the question. Meant to turn it around and instead ask Kakin about his own family, or whatever it took to avoid answering the question. That wasn't what happened though. Instead, what burst through his lips was, I wouldn't know. I'm pretty sure that she's too dead to have much of an opinion. Kakin looked up from his plate sharply. A bit of hollandaise sauce was smeared at the corner of his cheek. Izuka meant to bite his tongue. Meant to shut up. Instead, more words spilled out as he looked down at the French toast in front of him, made special like his mom had used to do. She's been dead for about a month, now. His eyes felt hot. The restaurant continued to move around them, people talking to each other. Out of the corner of his eye, Izuka could see a small family sitting at a nearby table. A father, a mother, and a son. They were smiling and laughing with each other. Izuka's family had used to be like that. Before everything had fallen apart, and he had to think about things like that. What the hell are you talking about? Kakin finally said. Your mom. He cut himself off and shook his head, his brow furrowing again. You're not making any sense. Start from the beginning, when you disappeared. Izuka clung to the solidity of the order and obeyed. You remember my dad, right? And the words just flowed from there. All of his arguments for not telling Kakin everything fell away, and the whole story spewed from his mouth as a torrent. The quirks, the presence, the training, the discovery, and then the fear, the tears, the running. The French toast was cold by the time he was done, and the traffic of the upper floor had lightened as people finished their meals. Izuka's voice was a croak from holding back tears, and Kakin's expression was unreadable as he stared down at his own cold plate of eggs benedict. Mom managed to send me the signal, so I knew not to go home, and yeah. He sighed and looked down, unable to stop a few tears from streaking down his cheeks. That's why I think mom's dead. Dad, dad really didn't like being disobeyed. And taking me away was really disobeying him. The silence between them drew out. 
The table where that family had been sitting at the start of Izuku's explanation was empty now, a waitress cleaning up the dishes. They clinked against each other as she piled them on her tray. Kakan's expression didn't change as he finally began to speak. Do you have a place to stay? Izuku blinked. That was, he'd been expecting a question about where his father was, or threats to go kick his father's ass, not this. I, um, yeah? Some people, they offered me a place to stay, they're pretty nice. Kakan narrowed his eyes. These people, are they asking for anything in return? For a second, Izuku didn't understand what he was getting at. Then it clicked, and his eyes widened. His hands flew up in an attempt to dismiss the insinuation as he babbled. No, no, never! They, well, one of them, they have a villain father as well, and they guessed that that was the case so they offered me a place when I needed it. All they ask is some help with the grocery money. Kaka nodded sharply, cutting him off. Good. They ask for shit like that, get the hell out of there. He leaned back in his seat, crossing his arms over his chest. I'll distract the hag, and you can stay at my house, got it? Warmth bloomed in Izuku's chest. He wouldn't do that. It was too dangerous. But the fact that the offer was there made him feel safe in a way he hadn't felt for over a month. I will, he lied. If it ever gets bad. Kakin nodded again. Right. On the next topic, have you told the pros about this? Our teachers? And the warmth drained away. You heard my story about the shelter, right? Izuka said, looking away. Of course I haven't. Out of the corner of his eye, Izuka saw Kakan's mouth twist. I'm not talking about a bunch of stupid fuckmunches in the triple digits of the rankings. I'm talking about our teachers. You know, the ones good enough to be hired by Yi? I'm pretty sure that they'd at least give you the benefit of the doubt. Izuka shook his head sharply. Villain's kids don't get the benefit of the doubt, he said sharply. And the USJ. I, I knew those villains there, Shigaraki and Kurojiri. They work for my father, and I've already confessed to Aizawa-sensei and Principal Nedza that I've seen Shigaraki before. There's no way that they'd believe I had nothing to do with it. Kakan's eyes widened at Izuku's confession, and Izuku internally cursed, readying himself for rejection because surely. Those two, that's why they attacked us while All Might was busy. They were trying to grab you. It wasn't a question. Izuka pursed his lips and nodded. Hi. They recognized me when Shigaraki disintegrated my helmet. I think that they got the impression that the heroes do know, since they haven't tried anything since. But if the teachers knew that I knew the villains that attacked us, they'll surely believe that I knew they were going to attack. They wouldn't. Izuka shook his head again. They would. What else are they supposed to think? Now it was Kakan's turn to purse his lips. Izuka could see him thinking, trying to figure out a way to convince him to tell someone. Look, Izuka said, I, I have this under control. I have a place to stay, and Mom made sure that I knew how to access the money we took on the way out. He looked down at his hands. Even in the best case scenario, I'd probably be kicked out of Yui. It's more likely that if I confess, I'll end up arrested and thrown into some hole to be forgotten. And I, I've wanted to be a hero all my life. I know it's selfish, but... His eyes began to burn and he trailed off, unable to put into words his need to be a hero. His need to make up for all of the people his father had killed in a twisted attempt to make him happy. He couldn't. Dropping his head, he squeezed his hands into fists. I can't, he said softly. I, I just can't, Kakin. I know you think the best of our teachers, but I've seen too many heroes not even listen when someone's related to a villain. I can't risk telling them. What about your mom, then? Kakin exploded, growling as smoke curled from where he was gripping the edge of the table. What about her? Are you just going to let that fucker get away with it? Hot rage stabbed through the anxiety that had been coiling in Izuka's chest. Of course not, he snapped. That's why I want to graduate. I want to become a hero and take him down, and I can't do that from a cell. The tears had begun to spill down his cheeks, scalding hot. Even if I tell, that won't bring her back. Distantly, Izuka was glad that this floor of the restaurant had cleared out by this point. It would have been really awkward to have to explain to someone else why he was crying into his brunch. Kakin's head jerked back like he'd been slapped. His jaw clenched, and he looked away. Sniffling, Izuku tipped his head back and blinked rapidly, trying to get the tears to stop. 
wiping at his cheek with his palm, he swallowed before talking. She's gone, he said, the words feeling like stones as they fell from his mouth. All I can do now is honor her by becoming a hero. Silence fell between the two of them. Izuka kept sniffling and having to wipe away tears while Kakin sat silently, staring down at his plate. God, it hurt, saying those words out loud. But they were true, won't they? His mom was gone, dead at his father's hands. She was gone, and never coming back. I'm sorry, Kakin finally said after the silence had stretched out to a minute. He didn't look up from his plate. I guess I didn't think of it like that. It's fine, Izuka said his voice tight from holding back even more tears. You've never had to think about these things. Kakin flinched. Their breakfasts were long cold at this point, the sauces congealed and toast soggy from syrup. Izuka's stomach curdled at the thought of eating any of it. Listen, Deku, Kakin said, finally looking up. There was an odd look in his eyes, guilt. I'll accept your decision not to tell our teachers. I doubt I could make you do it. But I want something in return. Izuka's voice croaked as he spoke. Okay? Kakin leaned forward. I want in. What? The other boy saw his confusion and made a derisive noise. I don't like lying, but do you really think that no one noticed your freak out yesterday after your match? People are going to be looking closer at you and asking questions. If you aren't careful, it won't matter that you didn't tell them. They'll figure out that something's wrong. Izuka swallowed as his stomach plunged. Listening to Kakin's words, he couldn't hear anything that he could disagree with. You're going to need someone to back your stories up, Kakin continued. So use me. Someone starts asking questions about your mom, I'll talk about how she's at work all the time. Someone asks about your dad, I'll tell them he's a fuckhead. The profanity shocked a wet giggle from Izuku, and a flash of approval played over Kakin's red eyes. T thanks, Kakin, Izuku said wiping at his damp cheeks one more time. I will. Though mom put down that he was dead on our new identities, so they probably won't ask about him right away. Kakin snorted in approval. Good. He should be dead to you anyways, he said. He looked at their unfinished meal in front of him and snorted again, this time in disapproval. This shit's disgusting. Let me pay for it and we can go somewhere else to get our stories straight. Izuka cringed a little, still smiling. Here, he said, reaching towards his friend's plate. Let me warm it up. I still have that quirk from when we were little. Kakin batted his hand away. Don't be dumb, warmed up eggs are disgusting. Let me at least cover my half, Izuka tried to offer. Stupid Deku, Kakin interrupted him, already pulling out his wallet. The words were fond, despite the derision inherent in them. You think I need you to pay for me? I'm not the one living on my own at fifteen. Warmth bloomed in Izuka's chest once more, and he sat back, a small smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. Thanks, Kakin, he said. I'll pick up the next bill, though. All right, then, Nedza said lightly. Now why don't we move on to the meat of this meeting, then? Shoyuta grunted his appreciation as the rest of the faculty in the room murmured their agreement. Even with his bandages finally off, he was more than glad to keep this meeting moving at a steady clip rather than continuing to pat themselves on the back for another well-done sports festival. Or not so well done, he thought, drumming his fingers on top of the disappointingly thin file labeled Midoriya Izuku. To start with, Nedza continued clicking the slideshow projected against the wall to the next slide. There's the matter of the empty seat in 1A. A picture of a familiar purple-haired boy appeared, his name neatly printed beside his head. Shinso Hitoshi, Vlad grunted, leaning back in his chair and crossing his arms. I'm against it. The boy's got a good quirk, yes, but that's all he's got. As things stand now, he wouldn't be able to keep up with the rest of the class. Shouyuta frowned at the other man, a rebuttal rising to his lips. All Might, in his reduced form, beat him to it, though. Is that really a reason to keep him out altogether, though? The other man asked. It's not easy for someone to reach the level of fitness required for the hero track without some sort of supervision. And I think that I can name a few students in there already that aren't that far ahead of Shinsukun in terms of fitness. Vlad was shaking his head though. That's not what I mean. In his fight with Midoriya, Midoriya was giving him a chance to hit him at the start, show what he could do outside of his quirk. That's the only reason why he wouldn't attack right away. Midoriya was practically begging him to take a swing, 
and he still stuck to his quirk. That sort of inflexibility is fatal in the field. This time, Shoyuta managed to defend Shinso first. He's a first-year high school student, Vlad. I checked his file. He's never been in a fight in his life. You can't blame him for not being able to read a fight as well as we can. Still, Vlad continued to shake his head. I can't support this. He's not ready. No one's ready when they first enter the hero course, Shoyuta said, hiding his irritation. The structure will do him good. Now, now, Nedza noted lightly. There's no need to argue. While Vlad has a point, so does Aizawa. Children need structure, and I doubt that Shinso is unaware of his weaknesses now after being thrown into the audience. Vlad grunted. Shoyuta narrowed his eyes at him, but didn't say anything. Looking around, no one else seemed to have anything to say. Nedza nodded, his tail twitching smugly. Taking their silence for obedience, Nedza continued. The only question, then, is what class Shinsukun will be in. What? Vlad frowned. 1A is the one with an open seat. Why wouldn't they take him? Have you forgotten that scream already? Namuri asked dryly from her own seat. The throwing him into the audience? She turned towards Shoyuta. I'm not so sure that it's a good idea to have him and Midoriya in the same class. Shoyuta grimaced, unable to argue. He drummed his fingers on top of the folder. Nedza noted the nervous gesture. You have something to say, Aizawa-san? Just some concerns I wanted to bring up about Midoriya, he replied. Most of it is just theorizing, but... He hesitated. He hated doing things like this. It was illogical to bring a theory into a conversation like this. However, it could directly affect Shinsu's entrance into the hero course. I believe that Midoriya's reaction to Shinsu's quirk has more to do with abuse in his past than Shinsu himself. The room went dead silent and still. Nedza put down his cup of tea carefully, his beady eyes gleaming. That is a heavy statement, Aizawa-san. Would you care to elaborate? Shoyuta grimaced. Not particularly. Like I said, I have no confirmation. It's simply a theory that I've put together from observing Midoriya since he entered my class. That's still serious, Shoyuta, Hizashi said, any trace of flamboyance missing from his voice. Everyone here knows how careful you are with things like this. You saying you have a suspicion is as good as a conviction. Shoyuta shot him a half-fond, half-annoyed look. Don't exaggerate, he chided. I'm not infallible. You're still usually pretty accurate with things like this, Namuri chimed in. And as teachers, it's our job to report these things if we even slightly suspect them. Midnight San is right, Nedza said. If you suspect that this is an ongoing abuse case, Shoyuta grunted. That's the thing. I don't think it's ongoing. I think it was in the past. The room was silent again. He sighed. Flipping open the folder, he pulled out the copied records he'd collected. He'd intended to discuss this in private with the principal but if he was being put on the spot he'd just have to roll with it. I first noticed a hint of problems on the first day, he said without preamble. Midoriya had to be pushed to fully use his quirk during my fitness tests, which is odd for a teenager basically given carte blanche to use his quirk. He tried to excuse it as not wanting to cause damage to the pitch, but his reactions to his fully powered up body were disturbing. He looked at himself in disgust and released his quirk as quickly as possible afterwards. Ah, uh, I remember that. All Might interrupted. But you thought that that was just the effect of a bad court counselor, didn't you? Shoyuta shot him a glare. I'm getting to that, he said coolly. All Might flushed at the rebuke, and he turned back to his file. Looking closer, his distaste for his quirk is a theme with him. On the way to the USJ, I even heard him refer to it as gross, despite his classmates' compliments. He paused. The only time I've ever seen him smiling while using his quirk was during the sports festival, in fact. That's worrying, Vlad noted, but it doesn't explain why you suspect abuse. Like All Might said, that could be explained by a poor quirk counselor. Heck, it could even be explained by an accident when he was young and his quirk had just come in. Like I told All Might, you haven't let me finish. Shuyuta didn't bother to hide the bite in his voice. There are other factors to my belief beyond what I've mentioned so far. He tapped his finger against the papers. His behavior for someone with such a strong quirk is strange too. Strange? The kid's a sweetheart, Namuri said. 
Yes, and that's the problem, Shoyuda replied. I know children with strong quirks. They're constantly praised growing up, to the point of arrogance. Even if they dodge that bullet, they have a certain confidence to them. He drummed his fingers against his papers. That confidence is missing entirely from Midoriya. He's positively timid, flinching away from flashy displays and always looking to avoid confrontation. He's not used to being the strongest person in a room. Shoyuda shook his head. After the USJ, he also revealed that he had seen one of the villains previously during the break-in and blamed himself for not informing us, despite having nothing other than a bad feeling about him. I know how abused children act, and Midoriya's behavior is closer to theirs than anything else. The final nail in the coffin were his actions after his fight with Shinso. He steepled his fingers in front of his face. I found him violently vomiting and crying in a bathroom. He mentioned his father and being unable to do something. No one said anything? Shoyuda continued, remembering that disturbing conversation. When I checked his records, his father was noted as being deceased, with his mother being his primary caretaker. She only has a weak telekinetic quirk, nothing like what Midoriya has. It's his father's quirk that he inherited, apparently. You think that his father was the abuser? Hizashi said, and the slight upset that Shoyuda could detect meant that he would be in for an earful tonight when they got home for not sharing. And that it only stopped when he died, then? His school records are unremarkable, no reports of bullying. Whatever made him the wreck he was in that bathroom, it came from home. As still, this feels like a little bit of a stretch. All Might noted, a droplet of sweat on his temple. Have you had a chance to directly ask Midoriya about this? Or his mother? Shoyuda grimaced. That's why I didn't want to share this yet, he said sourly. All of this is conjecture. Considering Midoriya's nerves, I wanted to build up more a relationship with him before trying to pry into his life like that. His father is dead, and digging up his corpse might do more harm than good if I'm forcing him to talk about it. I did call his mother, but it went direct to voicemail and she hasn't gotten back to me yet. Namuri grimaced. None of us have a good enough relationship with him to press about this. She pointed out. She looked at him over the top of her glasses. You really think that this is why he is the way he is? I won't claim to be infallible, but I'm pretty confident that I'm right. Shoyuda replied. She sighed at that, leaning back in her chair and crossing her arms underneath her breasts. So that makes two possible abuse cases in your class then. Shoyuda stiffened. I beg your pardon? Namuri nudged the mentos beside her. Ken and I heard some worrying things during Midoriya's fight with Todoroki. I'm sure that you noticed, the two of them were talking during the match, and well. The case is similar to yours, Samenta said stiffly. But if it is another case of abuse, both of us are certain that it's ongoing. I see, Nedza said, folding his paws in front of him. If you two would mind elaborating? Namuri sat forward, her eyes tight with worry. First of all, Shoyuda... Has Todoroki ever used his fire in class? Oh no. No, Shoyuda said. Not in the way he uses his ice. Damn it, damn it. His mind was racing ahead of them and he could already see the shape of what was coming. He'd been so distracted by the mystery of Midoriya that he hadn't seen. Namuri's lips twisted. Midoriya said several odd things to Todoroki about his use of his power during the fight. Mostly about how concerned he was about Todoroki hurting himself by not using his fire. But also about how Todoroki saw his fire as separate from himself, and how he wasn't using it to spite someone. Someone who apparently doesn't care about Todoroki, and only sees him as a tool. She tapped a crimson nail against the table. I don't know many people that would be close enough to Todoroki to do such a thing. Shouta clenched his jaw. Stupid, 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 not seeing the forest for the trees. Endeavor was not a pleasant man. A good hero. He wouldn't be the number two hero if he wasn't, but he was about as pleasant to be around as being sodomized by a cactus. He was self-important, overbearing, and frequently used excessive force when bringing in criminals, and that was in public, when the cameras were on. What was he like at home, where there weren't any? Todoroki's use of his quirk should have been a red flag to him. A giant red flag, lined with lights and with the pole topped by a siren. Shoyuda groaned and sat back in his chair. I'm sorry, All Might said in a slightly high-pitched voice. Are you accusing Endeavor? Yes. Namuri's expression was serious. We all know what Endeavor's like, and Midoriya's words. 
T those are just Midoriya's words, though. All Might interrupted, looking pale. Not Todoroki's. I'm sorry, All Might, Cementa said, sounding genuinely sorry. But Todoroki was definitely not contradicting him either. I don't like to think that we may have missed such a thing about a fellow hero, but as teachers it's our duty to investigate such things thoroughly. Shoyuta could extend a little bit of sympathy at the stricken look on All Might's face. He knew that the man didn't seem super aware of the enmity that Endeavor held towards him, but not even Shoyuta would have thought that Endeavor was capable of such a thing. He was a hero, after all. Well, that's what he got for thinking that heroes were better than that. He should have remembered that people were people. Well, that is definitely concerning, Nedza said, his face inscrutable. Aizawa-kun, do you have anything that would put Kiyama and Ishiyama's worries to rest? Shoyuta gritted his teeth. Damned Rodin knew perfectly well. No, he said sourly. I can't disagree with what they're saying. Frankly, I'm embarrassed that I didn't spot it before. Todoroki's hardly subtle with his ice use. I just assumed that he was trying to be less destructive than his father. He snapped his mouth shut. Hizashi put a comforting hand on his shoulder. I let myself get distracted, he said heavily. Why you can't blame yourself, Faizawa? All Might said. I've worked with the man many times and never suspected such a thing. Shoyuta grimaced. I'm his teacher, he said. Many students, I see more of them than their own parents, and I didn't even think to question his use of his quirk. He shook his head. It's unacceptable. I shouldn't have had to force my co-workers to pick up my slack. We all knew how todoroki Quinn uses his quirk, Nedza said, picking up his teacup again. Any one of us should have picked up that something was wrong. However, throwing around blame doesn't help young todoroki Quinn. Aizawa, considering the fact that you believe midoriya Kun's abuse is a past thing, you wouldn't disagree if I ask us to focus on the possible current abuse case, do you? It would be illogical to do anything else, Shoyuta said. We always need to focus on those currently in trouble, not those who were in trouble in the past. He hesitated. Though, if I could ask. We'll definitely keep an eye on Midoriya, Vlad said, speaking up again. Even if he's not comfortable with confiding in you directly, if he lets anything else concerning slip, you'll be the first to know. As well, Recovery Girl has been certified in crisis counseling, which I think would be perfect after his match with Shinsukun. At the very least, she can start getting an idea of how much help Midoriya Kun requires. We can start looking for more long term counseling as well, Niza added. Shoyuta didn't allow himself to show how grateful he felt at those words, but he nodded towards them. Thank you. In the meantime, we need to come up with a plan on how we're going to handle this investigation of Todoroki's home life. And that's a wrap, Legendary Legionnaires. Part 4 of What If Deku Had All for One? Can you believe it? But hold on to your capes, because the best is yet to come. Hit that notification bell, drop your predictions below, and let's keep this legendary journey going strong. Huge thanks for being the backbone of this hero revolution. Until next time, stay legendary, stay epic, and this is Kronos signing off. Catch you in the next episode, Legends.